Welcome to the Market Huddle with Patrick the Content Machine Serezna and Kevin the Macro Tourist Muir. So grab a drink, get comfortable, and get ready for a deep dive into the markets. Take it away, guys. It's May 30th, 2019, episode 30. I'm Patrick Serezna. And I'm Kevin Muir. Thanks for joining us this week. This week, we're proud to bring you a double feature. We start off by talking markets with Dave Collum and then bring back a huddle favorite, Harris Kupperman, better known as Cuppy, to talk Greece. And then Kevin's going to share one of his tales from the trading desk. And in, our hist- uh, in this week in trading history, we're going to go back to the 1990s to discuss AOL. For our WTF video, I take the Walk of Atonement, and then we end with the five most important things to watch next week. But before we start, I wanted to say that we had planned to talk about the yield curve and how to trade the steepener, but we decided to, that, to push that off till next week. All right, so let's jump into it, Kev. Uh, so we're going to bring our audio engineer, Lena, in to discuss the beer sponsor. How you doing, Lena? I'm great. That's good. So, uh, Lena, who's uh, this week's uh, beer brought to us by? Uh, this week, uh, we are drinking Cause and Effect Blonde Ale by Nickelbrook Brewery. Right. Um, so just to get a little description, Cause and Effect is our approachable, easy-drinking br- Blonde Ale that has a crisp finish. Pouring a bright golden yellow, this gently hopped and light body beauty exudes a bright aroma of grain, floral hops, and hints of tropical fruit. Um, oh. Flavors of biscuit, sweet grain, mild tree fruit, and notes of herb complement its light bitter finish. Ooh. Hey, Patrick, oh. I like it oh. so much better when Lena reads that than you. <laughs> no, I know. <laughs> I'm not finished yet. It says, oh. over, overall, uh, it's a go to crushable ale for any occasion. A so crushable ale. Yeah. Crushable ale. Someone, a millennial, is going to have to tell us what that means. Uh, <laughs> Because I don't have a clue. Next step up from hey, go, yeah, Lena, you got to Google that while we're uh, doing yeah. the rest of the show. <laughs> okay, let's All right, try I'm it. trying this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, actually, you know, that's really nice. It's crushable. It's, it, it's crushable. It's definitely crushable. I could, <laughs> I could drink this by the pitcher. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Let me do my All legal right. stuff yeah, here. Go for it. Kevin, uh, Kevin's legal stuff. Clients and employees of East West Investment Management may hold positions in securities mentioned in this podcast. Nothing in this podcast should be viewed as investment advice. Listeners should consult an investment professional before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned in this show. For more information, please visit eastwestfunds.com. Side effects of too much market huddle may include ice cream headache, adult humane society drop off, and or a severe case of Bundy. (laughs) Okay, Bundy. What do you uh, think a Bundy is? Uh, I please uh, why why don't you inform me what Bundy stands for? So it's a it's a medical term. My doctor friends told me, but unfortunately not dead yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so he's Bundy. All right. Oh, that's, 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 that's so me. Funny. That's how that's how most people describe me. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's go. Let's go to our uh, feature interview. Okay, now joining us is Professor Dave Collum, and I was just having a look at Dave's Twitter uh, page, and I noticed he he's, describes himself as a professor of organic chemistry at Cornell, but also as a libertarian, a fan of Austrian business cycle, zero hedge, gold, trigger warning. So I think, uh, Dave, uh, you feel like uh, you're going to be in good company with Patrick. You seem just <laughs> like him. Welcome to the show, Dave. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, you know, this is fantastic. I've been um, paying attention and listening to you guys for a long time. Um, so I, I don't know if people are aware, but you write this great year in review. And I was just having a look at the uh, 2019 one. And you said it said something that you've been doing this for 10 years. Yeah, time flies. It started as this little synopsis. It was about three paragraphs long, and then it and then it took off. There were a few sort of quantum leaps, but now it's almost uh, I have to do it. It's kind of a, a calling now. And, and were you always interested in the markets? Like, tell us a little bit about your history of why a, you know a organic chemistry professor is uh, busy getting quoted on Zero Hedge about his views on the market. 
Uh, that's an excellent question for which I have no good answer. Um, <laughs> I, I, you know, by the way, you should put the disclaimer. This should not be taken as investment advice. <laughs> hey, hey, listen, <laughs> we're, you're on the market huddle. Nothing should be taken as uh, investment advice. This is just all all for fun. Yeah. So I, uh, I I actually thought of going to Wall Street when I was a kid. And then I went off to the ag school at Cornell and and thought I was going to go to med school. And then I, I went off to get a PhD in organic chemistry instead. And then, uh, and for 20, 25 plus years till, till the, um, actually till the early nineties. And then, and then I started paying some attention to the markets cause I had accrued enough wealth that, you know, the boomers all went through that transition. And then I started to notice they were all screwed up and, and, uh, and by 99, I had exited, uh, um, somehow I'd gotten into gold. Boy, I don't, I can't recreate the the, the thinking that got me there. But uh, I've been a perma bear ever since. I I love 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 the idea of someday being able to buy cheap assets, you know, on sale. But um, it's just hard. The market seemed way overpriced. So when you look at the current environment, it must be driving you especially crazy. Uh, yes, except for the fact that it looks like it's it's nearing a conclusion, so I'm starting to get fairly calm. The, the markets look metastable to me, and so I think they'll, I think I'll get options. Um, the the real problem I faced in '09, for example, um, uh, everyone talks about selling in fear, and I I I didn't buy aggressively out of greed. I had plenty of cash, but uh, but hit, the markets in '09 never really plumbed lows. Uh, people think they did because they had their heads on fire, but uh, historical valuation showed they were about average. And so uh, I was waiting to uh, to buy stuff on fire sale and, and the Fed took that away from me. So next time I got to have a slightly different strategy, but uh, but then I think it, it will go on fire sale. And so I'll still eat it. So uh, <laughs> either way, I, I think I'm going to lose either way. So when you say going on fire sale, so are you thinking that we're going to have like a 75% kind of decline, like a 1929 style kind of depression? Is that what you're like, where you're coming from? Well, I'll, I'll hedge my bets and say 50. Um, I've been bearish long enough that, that, that time marches forward. And so yeah, you have to keep accounting for the fact that, Market should go up over time, um, but yeah, I'm kind of a Hussman type. Uh, he takes it down to what 65 or 70 percent correction. Um, if you're really correct for inflation, all these things, I, I put it this way, that wouldn't shock me. So, what is the 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 root cause of your thinking that why we're so overvalued, and what do you think will be the trigger that makes that overvaluation return to a regular valuation? Um. Well, I think the root cause is the Fed, but um, or or what is what makes me think they're overvalued? Uh, last year, the, the the 2018 year in review, I did a almost a comprehensive valuation analysis where I pulled out approximately 20 valuation metrics, which are always characterized by the price of assets divided by some metric that they ought to track, right? So whether it's GDP or you name it, there's, I came up with about 20 independent ones and they all show that we're about 2X overvalued. Um, meanwhile, profit margins are 2X overvalued too. Um, so the profit margins are sort, maybe that's the fact that now, you know, the entire economy being driven by Facebook, but um, but uh, uh, so so if those two things regress to the mean, you got a big problem on your hands. And then if they do damage, you got a worse problem on your hands. And so, and so, what do you think might be the trigger that would cause that overvaluation to come in? Like, where where do you come? Like, so are you just thinking that this is a big bubble that the Fed is has blown? And uh, and do you blame just the Fed, or is it all central banks? And is it all just you know from a monetary point of view, or do you think that there's something fundamentally even other something other sinister and nefarious kind of in the works as well? Yeah, it's actually a little of everything. So when I say the Fed, I really do mean global monetary authorities because they all work together. If you, anyone who hasn't noticed that just isn't paying attention. But, um, you know, so we quit QE and the following Monday, the Europeans start doing stuff, right? It's timed well. 
Um, yeah, I blame the Fed enormously. Uh, they're trying to distance themselves from wealth inequality problems. Um, I think the the wealth inequality is potentially a trigger. A, a system, this is what being a physical scientist will tell you, is any system that's way, way, way displaced from equilibrium, any system that's metastable, that's that's not moving, but, but has a huge potential energy built into it, um, the more displaced from equilibrium, the smaller the trigger is required to set it off. So, right, I mean, if, if you're dealing with, you know, nitroglycerin, you just vibrate it, right? Uh, avalanche, what triggers the avalanche? Who knows which wind, which snowflake? Uh, so, so you are safe when it's shock resistant, right? Um, okay, you know, there are companies that I think are, are they'll get burned, but they, they won't go insolvent they won't go broke but th there's so there's weird things out there right so you got a you got a 14 percent of the s p is said to be zombies they, they cannot pay their interest rates on their debt with their cash flow of the s p we're not talking about you know the the russell 2000 we're talking about the s p so what happens when credit tightens on those companies you're gonna have a massive sell-off and then the other thing that people don't realize is the reason sell-offs and the, the, the economy turned down so quickly in my opinion is that once it starts down you've got all these asset managers you got all these uh, CEOs and accountants who've, who've been shoving stuff under the rug and hiding it from, from so that they can keep getting their bonuses uh, and now under the under the, the cover of a deep recession they can now start spilling their guts and so all of a sudden the accounts will say well let's write down this let's write down this and and so all of a sudden, because no one should get fired because it's a recession, they can get rid of all the garbage that built up. So all the bad investments that they did and, and, and say, don't blame me. So that, that's and then they'll even build up what's called a cookie jar. Right. So they'll, they'll actually try to, you know, at the bottom, maybe tuck away some money so that they can go back to this, this appalling behavior of buying back shares um, to boost their 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 own personal gain. Um, that, that they could even build up something to do that. Right. So the sell off is going to be hard, I think, when it starts. So, David, it's Patrick here. I wanted to uh, just um, circle uh, to bonds because recently we've had this big run in bonds and the yields have been uh, just dropping very quickly. Uh, what's your take on the bond market and, and the, what we're seeing here in interest rates? Okay, so here's a question I'll ask rhetorically. I'm going to dodge your question because I don't, I don't know. You know, people will say, "Well, that's a sign of recessions coming." I actually thought a recession was starting in late '18, and I haven't given up that idea. When the, uh, the NBER comes up with its final call on a recession, I wouldn't be shocked if it was actually already in play right now. Um, the question I like to ask people is, is if if you were going to be offered a 30-year Treasury, and you're you're in a investor, not a trader, you're an investor, right? Which is what they're held by, they should be. Um, what interest rate would you demand if you had to hold that treasury to term? And when you guys want to answer that question, <laughs> what would you, Dave, what would you require to, Dave, I'll, what would you require to say, I'm buying and holding for 30. Yeah. Okay. Give so me an interest so rate. Dave, what, uh, this is Kevin speaking. I would demand eight or 10% because I think inflation's coming. Patrick would de demand about, I don't know, 50 beeps because he thinks the world's going to end in a deflationary spiral and that uh, he's going to 30 years. Though. Yeah, for sure. He's uh, you know, he's pretty uh, he's pretty bearish on the whole world. So uh, I, I just so you guys are nutballs at the end of the uh, at the end of the spectrum. Uh, um, so uh, the bet, I'm with the you, bet, Kevin. Uh, uh, so go. I'm 10 percent. I, I feel like I, I just I, I think inflation's coming. So I think you're nuts to lend to the government for 30 years because if you look over time i always ask people how many countries do you know that have uh you know imploded from deflation i know zero but i know lots that have inflated their their wealth away and so i'm just amazed at the uh the thought that you would go and lend to the government that is has the ability to create money and create inflation even though Patrick doesn't think they do. Oh, um, listen, are you speaking for me, right? Like, do yeah, I, you get, know, I, to, do anyways, I get to but, chime but, in my... No, no, but you know what? Actually, Patrick, I'll, I will say something. Dave, what's you your... guys do this a lot, yeah. don't you? Are you guys married? Yeah. Is this like a gay marriage <laughs> thing now? We, we have something to tell you. We're really safe. coming out. Uh, no, so Dave, I just, I wanted to say, um, I'm going to turn the question back to you. What would you demand? Oh, it would be a high number. I, I, I'd have to think hard about it, but it would it would be a high number. And I, I did a Twitter poll on it, 
and it it went viral. It reached out to people who couldn't give a damn what I think. Um, and uh, and the Twitter poll put it at a high number. I didn't go ridiculous, so I think it was over eight percent or something like that. And that was the dominant answer. So then the question is, if Treasuries are currently priced to return four percent, and everyone on the planet says I wouldn't touch those things for under eight percent, then are they priced correctly? And the answer is no. So why do you, and you say, why, well, but I don't hold on to them. I go, well, then someone's got to hold on to them. That's a Hussman argument, right? Someone's got to hold on to them. They're not priced right. They're they're priced like trading sardines at this point, right? Right. Well, that famous story that everybody knows about the trading sardines is that uh, these there was this, um, I'll just tell it very quickly. There was, uh, what was it? I, I believe it was in the docks in the Netherlands or something like that. And they had a bubble created in sardines and uh, they were trading them back and forth, back and forth. It was kept going higher and higher until finally the bubble collapsed. And someone got long, and they and he says, "Oh well, at least I can eat the sardines." And he opens the sardines, and he finds out that they're that they're actually bad. That they've gone, that they've been trading them for so long that there's no longer good sardines. And and he and he looks at the other guy and says, "You know, uh, I can't I can't believe these are bad. We've been trading bad sardines all the time." And he says, "Those weren't uh, eating sardines; those were trading sardines." And that's what your <laughs> argument is about about the about bonds. So there you go. I completely concur, Dave. Uh, the uh, Patrick is just playing a greater fool game with his long bond position. Well, there you guys go at it, bickering in the kitchen again. <laughs> um, so, so the 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 the, the related story is the two farmers selling a pig back and forth for more and more each time, and one finally butchers it, and the other guy says, "We're getting rich off that pig." Um, so yeah, so so we're trading sardines right now, and 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 the question I've asked countless times is why is sovereign debt so mispriced? And one of the reasons is there are statutes requiring people buy sovereign debt. There are deals with countries like China that says you buy our sovereign debt and we'll keep doing whatever it is we do, buy all your stuff. And we've got, you know, the Arabs buying our debt and and, and we we get their oil. And, and so, so, these are the mispricings, right? It's not, a, it's not a, it's not a marketplace anymore. Right. And you say, Oh, that can't be. Well, look at Japan. Japan's bond market doesn't even trade anymore because it's such a disaster zone. By the way, I don't know if you saw this. There's a there's junk bond in Japan that's about to try a junk bond, corporate junk bond I, that's about to trade at one percent. I tweeted one percent for a junk. I bond. tweeted that out, Dave. It was right on Zero Hedge, our favorite site, right? So yeah, and- <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but exactly. but the conspiracy yeah, theorists. Yeah. But, it, but 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 it, it it's actually a testament to. Uh, to what's happening, which is is that yield uh, uh, interest rate suppression or financial repression continues to be the name of the game. And there's just so much debt out there that uh, free price discovery for bonds is just not, uh, in my mind, uh, going to happen without there being systemic risks that are. Uh, in- so here's the question. Can they sustain this forever? Oh, absolutely not. No, no, no. There's an end game. Like, okay, so therefore, yeah. therefore, if they're insolvent now, if they're insolvent in the future, they're insolvent now. I just saw that quote today. Uh, they're insolvent. Okay, so, but then I ask you, well, I'll, I'll turn it this way. Who, who has an incentive to see the system fail? Nobody, in my opinion. Who has an incentive to see my lab blow up when something has a decides to blow up in my lab, right? It doesn't require but, but, incentive. But the point is, is that everyone has an incentive to keep the existing system going as long as possible. Hence why in Japan, you have pretty much zero and negative interest rates for going on for decades. I mean, ultimately, you're right. There, there has, there's going to be some sort of a reset. It doesn't have to be as doomsday as everyone makes it, but well, you, you can't have $250 trillion of global debt without there being some way that this is all reset. And what that will look like um, is something that I guess I, I'm not smart enough to fully see as to how it plays out. But in the interim, the, I'm, I just continue to believe everyone's going to be shocked how long they're going to be able to keep it going. I think it's going to. Oh, I don't doubt that. I don't doubt that. And that's. I agree with that. And that's uh, that's uh, sort of the premise of my argument there, Kev, is is that it's not that uh, over time it isn't going to be it's uh, that it's going to it's going to play out at some point. It's just uh, I'm, I personally think it'll be, everyone's going to be shocked how long they're going to keep this uh, this uh, repression going. Well, uh, Patrick, we don't. OK, so here's the question, though. Here's the question, though. So your bonds now, you, you don't own 30 year bonds buy and hold, right? Or do you not buy? Well, you you know, I'm a trader, right? So, so I'm laddering like two and three year bonds, right? 
and and I'm get I'm finally getting return. I didn't bother before, right? It wasn't even worth the trouble. I go, okay, I'll take my 0.001 percent off a checking account. Um, and, and and so so now you get off. Let's say let's say you've laddered up to five years a year, two and a half percent, right? So real return that's zero. Yeah. And then equities are priced to the stratosphere. So the real the real price earnings ratio is probably uh, is probably um, going to return you maybe another two and a half percent inflation adjusted. You're now down to zero percent. Your only hope is some dividends, which, by the way, are are uh, are uh, are um, um, probably two percent. So so we're priced now for you to make essentially nothing inflation yep. adjusted. Yep. And and so then the, the the question is okay, going forward the economy will grow. So as the economy grows, that's your return now. So you, your return now from these. If we started high valuations and ended high valuations, which every market in the goddamn world is at, um, the question is what what is your return? And your return is the cash flow from viable entities which you've paid too much for, and GDP growth. And so the returns going forward are going to be awful. And if we regress to the historical mean, your returns are going to be absolutely positively negative for a long time. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to jump in here because, uh, Dave, when we were chatting before the show, you said you have an opinion on absolutely everything. So I'm going to, I'm going to put you on the spot. China-U.S. trade war. What's going on and how is it going to resolve itself? Okay, that's a fascinating one. When it first started, I thought it was just Trump throwing out grenades at China and, and there'd be some quick swapping of, of trade deals and, and then uh, and then it would go away. And now it's starting to look like people are digging their heels in. So uh, my view on it is, and I know guys who hate Trump who say this is still true, and that is I think that right now our 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 trade relationship with China is out of balance because we set up these great deals for China back in what was it, 81 or two or so, I don't know, way back when I was just a youngster. And and we 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 help them emerge from from medieval China, right? And 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 those trade deals are now way out of date. And then of course they steal shit from us and they do all the things that they do. And so 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 as Kyle Bass said, as not, guys like that say, look, I hate Trump, but we uh, we need to to renegotiate these things. So his economic policies are correct, and I I'm inclined to believe that. Uh, now, however, you've got now you've got a, a kind of a pissing match going on between China and the U.S. And that the longer it goes, the more problematic I think it's going to get. And it could turn into a mess. My big fear, besides uh, I'm not afraid of global warming one bit. Um, an EMP would do a number on us. The Yosemite volcano would do it, but a land war, some conventional war with China, would be. Uh, I'd be. I'd be heading for bunkers fast. Well, there you go. So listen, now we're going to wrap it up here. And what we're going to do, if you want to hear more about Dave and uh, all the, the the awful things that could happen in the world, that, that not including global warming, make sure you stick around for the after hours. In the meantime, Dave, why don't you tell us where they can find you and where they can find your year in review? Because that's a great publication that everybody should go and read. Um, if you search just my name, David Column, Year in Review, you'll find all sorts of stuff. But um, it, it, it's found at peak prosperity. Um, I discovered this this week that my searches are giving me funny results. <laughs> they're, they're not taking me to peak prosperity. So you can find it at peak prosperity. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at David B. Column. David B. Column. That's my Twitter name. And uh, got a picture of me. And uh, and you'll recognize the feed because it's a bunch of inane things about a bunch of inane topics. Well, that's great. Well, thanks for joining. <laughs> thanks for joining us, David. For everyone else, for everyone that wants to hear more, Dave, make sure you stick around for the after hours. Okay. At this point, we're going to be pleased to uh, kind of welcome our second guest uh, by popular demand. A lot of people saw that I tweeted out the fact that uh, Harris. Uh, Kupperman, the author of Ventures in Capitalism, tweeted out something about his latest pick, and I tweeted it out, and a lot of people were like, you got to get him back on, and so without further ado, here is Cuppy. Hey. hey. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for having me. Um, well, thanks for coming on again. It's great to hear from you. I actually loved the first piece, be, uh, the, fir the piece you just wrote, because you referenced yourself as a macro tourist. 
and I and I thought <laughs> I knew you'd like that. Yeah, I was like, oh, that's that's a guy's like uh, that's a near and dear to my heart. So why don't you tell us about it? You know, I think last time we spoke, you were actually phoning from that same trip, I believe, or maybe I was wrong. Um, but why don't you tell us about your latest pick? Sure. Uh, so Greece has basically had a ten-year economic crisis, uh, partly self-inflicted, actually mostly self-inflicted. Every time it seemed that they were getting out of the crisis, they found a new way to come back into the crisis. Uh, you know, things were starting to recover a few years ago, and they decided to, to try Grexit. And then they decided, you know, they didn't really want Grexit, but they'd scared all the investors off again. Um, and so anyway, you've had sort of this lame duck government there, the socialist government that uh, tried Grexit, failed at Grexit, has a bunch of internal feuding themselves, uh, basically strangled the economy with uh, – high taxes and high regulations and all these things that uh, the Eurozone wanted in order to stabilize the finances of Greece. That's right. Wasn't that uh, wasn't that the Troika that demanded that from them? Yes. Right? Yes. And, I mean, you can't solve a debt crisis with more debt. You can't uh, – you need no matter what, you have to outgrow your liabilities. And trying to have a 1% budget surplus when you have 190% debt to, debt to GDP, I mean, it's a – to get to something stable is going to take you a hundred years. It's just not possible. Right. And so they tried it for a decade anyway. Uh, they proceeded to bankrupt all the banks about three times. Um, I mean, there's a lot of guys who bought the second bailout and thought they were getting the real bargain. And they didn't realize it was going to be one or two bailouts. It's like one of those, uh, those uh, restaurants, you know, like the restaurants where like, you, you always say you're supposed to make money on a restaurant by buying it after someone goes bankrupt. But it's like a location yeah, that like, goes bankrupt three or four times. Yeah. Yes, yes. I mean, Fairfax might have done like six bailouts of some of these banks. It's, <laughs> it's, 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 I, I mean, we talked about this uh, last time. It's not exactly like the Greek bankers are really playing along. You know, when you met them, they're like, yeah, yeah, we got this under control. Don't worry about it. But uh, over the weekend, I was looking at some of my uh, charts and looking at some of my uh, information on the Greek banks trying to get caught up and – it's amazing how little of the uh, non non-performing exposures they've actually solved over the past year and a half since I was there last time. It's almost like they didn't want to kick their friends out of these houses. <laughs> almost. So like. they just did nothing and sat there. Yeah. Right? So now, what's changed? What like what what's made you excited about Greek? Because like you're giving you're painting a picture where it's ugly, but what's changed? Well, I mean, it's terrible right now, but it's going to get better. Um, so you have this uh, political party called New Democracy. Think of them like your free market, pro-business guys. Their platform is cutting taxes, reducing regulations, uh, getting a bunch of, uh, I guess, mega projects moved forward. I mean, when I was there a year and a half ago, they were arguing about this stupid airport. So the Athens airport d doesn't have the capacity for all the tourists to land. And most of the Greek economy is Chinese people going to see the Parthenon. So if you can't get more tourists, the whole economy can't grow. And... At the time I was there, there was three archaeologists that were holding up a five or ten billion dollar airport because they said there might be something of archaeological significance where they wanted to build the airport, and so they they, they were given I think it was like a five or ten year window to go look for stuff, and of course the entire economy froze because of some pottery shards, and it's just one of these like typical Greek things where. Everyone stands in the way. It's a cultural thing. Everyone stands in the way looking for a payoff to get out of the way. And so anyway, this new democracy group, it, they're kind of of the view that uh, they're actually going to get these projects moved forward. They're going to build infrastructure, power plants, uh, all these good things that are good for the economy. Uh, I don't know if they're actually going to succeed. I mean, running a country is very hard. Talking about your plan is easy. But what we've seen happen multiple times in uh, emerging markets, particularly ones where they're really, really beat down, is that when the new guys come in and the new guys have a plan that makes sense, the new guys can articulate that plan in London and New York and talk to iBankers, you can get a lot of Wall Street types on side and they can say, you know, I'm looking at you know this Greek uh, ETF and five years ago it was at 25, today it's at $9. There's a lot of upside. And you know, you kind of draw your charts back further and you see more upside and i think this is gonna be a lot like argentina argentina i mean the joke about argentina is that uh, about every decade they have an economic crisis and it seems to last about 10 years <laughs> and <laughs> you, you guys oh, have heard that one right no i haven't that's a great line but yeah. like it's awesome <laughs> 
so anyway, like that, that's Argentina for you. But this fellow Macri came along and he said all the right things. And if you held for two years, you doubled your money. And along the way, they've devalued the currency. They have runaway inflation. Half his plans haven't really worked. Uh, he's got a bunch of political roadblocks. It's questionable if he's going to stay in power in the future. Like it, it hasn't really worked. But he said all the right things. The ETF doubled anyway. And I mean, if you look at this in like Brazil with their new guy, um, like if they say the right things, the market goes up yeah. because uh, foreign investors want to believe. And with Greece as beat down as it is, and with these guys, I think being great at telling the story of their plan, I think you're going to have a recovery. Uh, I've traveled to every country. I, I, I travel nonstop to funny places that are having crises. And the only time in my life that I've ever seen an opposition party having a resting order with a broker where my broker just, you know, we'd seen some of these banks and my broker said, we're going to go meet with new democracy. We're going to meet, uh, probably shouldn't say who, but one of the most senior guys in the party, he wants you to come to his office. He's a member of parliament. And I said, why does this guy want to meet me? I'm kind of a nobody. Like, I, I, I'm not going to do anything in Greece. I mean, I don't even have, I don't even intend to open a brokerage account. And my broker said, yeah, yeah, just come, trust me. We sat there for two and a half hours talking about uh, what their plans were for new democracy and when they came to power. And I thought it was the most amazing thing. It, I kind of said to myself, if these guys ever win an election, I want to be long. And I, I asked this guy, why would you waste your time with me? And he just said, when we win and we know we're going to win, we want you to be aware of us so that you can go and invest. And I mean, I think he was thinking go and invest, meaning I'll do some PE deal or, you know, go buy a hotel and operate it myself. And I don't think he really meant I was going to buy GREK, but it's the same sort of concept as capital comes into the country. You know, it, it, it helps everyone. And I just thought it was interesting. That he wanted to make that point that he was so pro business that he was kind of preceding it by two years. So anyway, what, what just happened is uh this week, uh, they announced snap at elections, and it's about six months early, and it looks like New Democracy is going to win by a landslide and become the largest party in parliament. And I don't think a lot of people outside Greece, because most people don't follow Greek politics, I don't think most of these guys have a clue who these people are. And as people learn who New Democracy is and what they stand for, I think you're going to have a, a trade higher. I mean, we've already seen it for three days in a row where the Greek stock market's been up a few percent each day. Yeah. I think that trend's going to continue for a while because it's not a liquid market. It's super bombed out. There's a lot of uh, capital that sloshes around with hedge funds, a lot of trend following guys. And I mean, th think, of, think of Greece, okay? They, they did everything they could to screw up the country. <laughs> like, they went back and forth for a decade on do we want Grexit or not? I mean, what do you think that does to liquidity in your banking system, like your whole financial system, when every three months you're like, yeah, we're, we think we're going to do Drachma this month. <laughs> no, nah, let's do it next month. And, you know, they, <laughs> it was just terrible. But for the last five years, they can't hit the stock market anymore. It just won't go down. No matter what stupid stuff they dream up, it won't go down. And that usually tells you it's kind of bombed out and it's in super strong hands because if you were willing to own it knowing you're getting Drachma, I mean, you're, 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 you're strong hands. So I don't think there's a lot of free float and liquidity. So as some of this uh, capital flows back into Greece, uh, it should lift the market quite a lot. And, you know, Argentina shows what happens when a small market sees some fund flows. You had a double. Yeah. All right. So, so uh, copy one second. I'm going to interrupt. It's Kevin. I, I read your post and, and you sold me, buddy. I ran out and bought some. I completely agree. Uh, that this thing could run a long way. I don't think it would take much for to move this market. It's a small market, like you said. It, it, like this thing, it doesn't trade that much. The Greek, mar like the market capitalization. I bet you Apple could buy Greece tomorrow if they wanted to. Yeah, no, <laughs> it it lost. Uh, I think hey I think ninety nine percent of its capitalization was wiped out during the the last decade, right? Like. Uh, it's, it, it's a crazy like I have a chart up here of the Alpha Bank. Hold on, let me pull the, pull this up. And <laughs> that's another winner. <laughs> uh, and uh, like th th this this thing at its peak was four hundred and eighty dollars back in two thousand and seven, and it's forty two cents today. Yeah, it's, it looks like the VIX chart. Yeah, the VXX. <laughs> like you know when you own the VXX and you put that chart up. <laughs> 
It's like, the wealth, this is, this the is crazy. wealth destruction. Uh, your question is: Has have just people lost more money being long VXX or the Alpha Bank? It's going to be a tough one to decide. It's, it's going to be a tough one to decide. <laughs> uh, but but you know, I mean, when you're when you're starting off at such a low base, I mean. Uh, that's where, like I was saying, that this is where value investors lo- uh, can go shopping all day long. I mean, they've they've bled this out and left it for dead. So, I mean, at this stage, you have a lot of things that can go right, and and a lot of the really worst case scenarios have been more or less baked into the cake, right? Uh, don't 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 say that. It's <laughs> Greece. They'll find a way to screw it up. <laughs> So, so, I mean, so, Cuppy, I want to tell you something. On, what's the what's the stat on Greece? In, in they've been an independent country for a little over a hundred years, and like eighty of those years, they were restructuring their debts or something. <laughs> they've only been like current for like twenty percent of their time as a nation, or some crazy statistic like that. I when I tweeted out your uh, your comment, your post, I, I saw somebody saying something to the effect that. Uh, I think this fellow had been long, but he was selling it, and he was he was a Greek, and he said something to the effect that like we're gonna find a way to screw it up, kind of to that to that <laughs> l- line. And I thought to myself, um, you know that Don Cox. I don't know if you know Don Cox is a strategist in Canada, and he has this line. He says, "Those who know it best love it least because they've been burned the worst." Yeah. And I think that's I think that's a very fitting comment here because it, to me it feels like everybody has given up. There is nobody left to, to buy it. Like, you know, I saw in Real Vision a year ago this this very, per, you know, persuasive uh, kind of argument that you should buy Greek banks. It's been a hedge fund darling, and I thought it was kind of funny that you said that they bought the last, two of the last three restructurings thinking this is the time. And I, you're, well, It's been a graveyard of hedge funds. Right, and you're the only guy. You're so lonely, uh, you know, recommending this. I love it. I love it that you're all alone. Nobody's talking about it. These are the kind of trades. How, how many that, years know, ago was it that Kyle Bass was doing the, the green shoots in Greece? 2000, 2014, he did his first bailout. <laughs> He's been around for two or three recaps. <laughs> <laughs> He's in Piraeus Bank. Uh, he, he's done two, three, four. I don't know. I, actually, it was funny. I met the, the CFO of uh, Piraeus Bank. I think that's the one he's in. Um, let me just make sure. And I, I think it's that one. No, no, no. He, it, it, Paulson's in Piraeus. And uh, anyway, I met the CFO, and I'm like, oh, that's cool. You've met Paulson. He's like, yeah, we've met him every time we've restructured. It's great. He always <laughs> <comes."> <laughs> It's like, like he takes an annual trip to Greece and gives us more money. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh. Keep in mind, though, I have two Greek readers. So I, I always appreciate what my uh, readers on Adventures in Capitalism say. Two of my Greek readers wrote me back immediately and they said, Cuppy, be careful. We're Greek. We're probably going to screw you. <laughs> No, but even there, they're bearish. They're, they're thinking like I'm telling you, there's nobody that nobody is bullish. You were the only guy. You were so lonely. It's it's almost worse. Than, like it is worse than my uh, short bond call. Like that's how that's how lonely you are. <laughs> You're all alone there in the wilderness, just saying, you know, buy it, buy it, buy it. I think it is a great call. I'm giving it a whirl because I think what's you know what's, what's the, the timing? Yeah, I mean, a year and a half ago I was there, and it was just obvious that there was nothing to do. Things were cheap, but there was nothing to do. You need that catalyst because if nothing good is happening, something bad might happen. <laughs> I think you have a free shot between now and the elections next six weeks. See the stock trade up and then see how much of a majority, how many seats they get in parliament to see basically how much it might trade up in the future. Um, and uh, I spent a lot of time. Uh, I went with a couple of friends to Greece and we were talking through all the names and all our notes. And my friends kept – you just going down the list, and my friends were like, nah, that sucks. No, nah, those people seem like crooks. No, nah, I don't want to own those shares. Nah, that sucks. So that's why I bought GREK because there's absolutely no one stock I want to own. We went through all the big ones, and they all suck. So you <laughs> might as well just have a basket of the big ones. <laughs> a basket of sucky stocks. A basket of sucky stocks, yes. Uh... That's my new fang. <laughs> Okay, well, anyways, Harris, thank you very much for joining us. It's it's great it's to hear great. your story. Actually, before we leave you, you have any updates on Sting for us? Like, since uh, I know you've created a lot of lo- loyal uh, Huddle fans, because uh, when we, uh, I think we had our our podcast and you appeared, and the thing ran like it stole something, like it just took off. And yeah, I like that phrase. Yeah, so uh, uh, maybe you'll be uh, t- two times lucky. What do you do? You have any updates for us on Sting? Yeah, so. Uh... 
Sting basically good Q1 earnings. They they beat where I thought they'd be. Uh, since then, charter rates have dipped. I think they're going to be a little soft in Q2. I took a few off the table. The chart looks great. It's a nice big base. And it's building a flag. But um, I took a few off the table just because, well, I mean, I'm up, what, 50% on a very large position, and uh, the rates are a little weak. I think rates will start spiking, though, uh, in a f next month or two. And as we get into IMO 2020, they'll probably just keep uh, building up. So if the stock doesn't uh, pull back at all, I'll probably add back what I sold. If not, um, you know, I'll Hopefully, I get a little bit of a pullback, but things are looking good. Nothing's changed in the thesis. One last thing: you don't worry about the uh, the trade war because ultimately that'll mean less world trade. Well, trade wars are good for shipping. Remember that. Uh, I think it's this real misnomer that trade wars are bad. Yeah, if you're talking about like uh, containers or something, yes, because you're going to have less stuff going to Walmart. But if you're thinking of a trade war and we're going to say Iranian oil can't go to this place and you know Venezuela isn't allowed to have refined products, so it has to come from this. Every time you move something around the map, you make it less efficient. And when it becomes less efficient, you need more ton miles to move the same amount of product because Venezuela still needs refined product and Iran is still going to sell oil somehow. And so as you make the whole supply chain less efficient globally, you need more boats. And more boats means – more boats needed means wow. higher charter rates. Wow. There's that, a number of boats. That's there. like uh, – that's counterintuitive thinking. That's uh, – I, I never thought of it that way. That's right, uh, I love it. And also – and you also get huge amounts of bottlenecks where you have boats sitting out at a port because a port's designed for X number of boats and suddenly uh, twice as many boats show up because you've moved all the supply chains around and you have boats sitting there three, four days waiting to unload or reload, which also uses up supply. Remember, you have, when you think of supply in this industry, your supply is number of boats on the water times number of days that the boats are serviceable right and so if you're wasting three four days here three, you start taking away global supply really fast right well there you go so uh taking a little off the table on sting but you're looking for a dip that you're going to buy again or if it keeps going you're going to you know jump back in is that the end of the kind of the yeah synopsis? I, mean, I, I still exactly i still have 75 percent look it was uh, better than 20 percent position when i put it on it went up uh more than 50 percent and humans aren't meant i mean Portfolio managers aren't supposed to have uh, positions that start with a three in terms of position weighting. It's you, you got to be prudent at some point. So that, that's the reason I cut it back a little. But it's uh, still 75 percent of what I had. Copy. You assume that uh, portfolio managers are human. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I play super concentrated positions, but when you get when you get to 30, you got to cut it back. I hear it's you. Just, I, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Okay. So listen, thank you so much for joining us. For those who want to learn more about you, you and uh, kind of follow you, uh, what's the best place to reach you? Uh, Adventures in Capitalism is my blog. Sign up for updates. Uh, otherwise, uh, reach out to me directly. Uh, H. Cuppy, sorry, Cuppy at Adventures in Capitalism. Well, thanks okay. again. It was great having you on. Thanks great. a lot, Cuppy. Thanks, guys. Cheers. 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 Now uh, it's time for tales from the trading desk, and uh, Kev, you're on a roll. So, uh, what uh, what tale do you have for us this week? Well, I got a short and sweet one for you, Patrick. Okay, it's from my days at uh, on the institutional desk at uh, at a Canadian bank, and I remember I was so proud of myself um, because I had come up with this trade, and to me, it seemed so smart and so clever, and I was just uh, I I was so proud that I had come up with this, and I. And I explained it to one of the guys on my desk, and he didn't get it. Like, I, I literally I explained it to him, and he just kind of looked at me, and he didn't get it. And I said, why don't I leave that with you for the next uh, hour, and we'll talk about it in an hour time. And uh, then I went on to one of my, uh, my good friends and uh, the guy who hired me, and he got it instantly. Like, I explained it to him, and he's like, that's a great trade. That's terrific. And then I went to my uh, the the boss on the desk, and I explained to him the trade. And halfway through the trade, he he interrupted me and he said, "No, no, no, I you know I, I I got it." And I said, "No, no, you haven't heard the really smart part." And he says, "No, no, like I, I get it. You're gonna do like this, this, and this, and this." And I said, "Oh my God, you really are smart." And then I want to tell you that like that was kind of shocking to me how quickly he got it and how and how how smart this fellow was. But then I went right. to see this guy on the, um, let's just say it was the proprietary uh, desk. It was the envy of Canada. This was one of the smartest guys around. And I contend one of the smartest fellows I've ever met. And he traded proprietary for our bank. And I went to see him and he was always, uh, 
he was always kind of the envy of everyone. He, you know, you'd go see him and you'd, you'd ask him, you know, he'd ask you what you were done that weekend and you'd say, well, I went mountain biking up in Northern Ontario. And he would say, oh, that's great. And he'd listen to your story very politely. And then you'd ask him what he did. And he said, well, I flew to v- BC and I went to uh, mountain biking in, on Whistler and whatever. Like this guy was a rock star. And then the pisser was, he was good looking. He was smart. And, uh, I went to see him and thinking, okay, this is my chance to really impress him. So I, I kind of got there and I started telling him about the trade and he instantly stopped me when he heard the name and he says, I've had that trade on for two weeks already. <laughs> so that was my lesson about how, you know what, when you think you're smart, there's always somebody smarter. There's always somebody better. There's always someone that is way ahead of you in the markets. And he was an example of it. Wow. That's well, that's that's a, a good tale there. I'd say, you know, it, it's amazing, uh, you know, how when you're doing a trade like that, like that you, you come up with it, but there's always some catch that you're missing often, often. Uh, and you, you, you have to kind of run it by a number of people to, to kind of always find out wh- where you're missing that one little thing, right? Yeah, well, and not only if you're not missing it, it's, it's kind of interesting to, interesting to see how many people are ahead of you and how many people have already figured it out or, you know, how, how long yeah. it takes them to understand the trade. Cause sometimes trades are a little more complicated and uh, there's just such a wide variety of uh, people yeah. that are, that are like of different market intelligence. And when you meet one of these people and shit, this guy, Patrick was so smart. And if I could be half as smart as him and half as wealthy. Yeah. I should. I'd even take a tenth of as wealthy as this guy is. He's gone on to be one <laughs> of the uh, the wealthiest guys in Canada in terms of running a hedge fund. He's really, really smart. And I contend that uh, that he's he's kind of if he if he was American, people would be fawning all over him. And the only reason that he's like this is because he's Canadian. And he's just chosen not to go into the U.S. Because I I'll put him up against the best of America any day. I think he's that smart. Oh, that's awesome. Well, thanks for sharing the story. So uh, let's move on. So, Kev, it's time for this week in trading history. Your favorite part. It is my favorite part. And so uh, I wanted to go back to uh, May 24th of uh, 1985. Now, it's actually um, two, two dates that came in, in this week. Uh, May 24th was actually last week, but, uh, but uh, there's another date that f- f- fell in. I'll get to it in a moment for on May 28th. But it, it was for quantum computer services. Do you know uh, what uh, quantum computer was before it got renamed? No clue. That's, oh, yes, you do. You do. Anyway, so it was uh, the original uh, online services company um, that ended up becoming AOL, right? You and got mail. Yeah, and so it was back uh, then that qu- uh, they, uh, Quantum Computer Services was made, and they launched uh, in 1988 uh, through Quantum this Apple Link. It's a personal edition for the Macintosh computers. And then later um, uh, that year, they launched PC Link, which l- was linking uh, IBM compatible PCs as well as a vo- uh, joint venture with Tandy Computer. I want to know how many people remember Tandy Computers. That's like, uh, I remember that as a kid, like with the Commodores and stuff like that. Anyway, so it's, it was the birth of AOL. And uh, so Steve Case, who's uh, shown in this picture, uh, put the company together. And uh, it was in, um, in 1989, they lost their Apple uh, deal and they renamed at that time to America Online. And, uh, and so American, America Online went to uh, go on to being a huge uh, marketing juggernaut. Right. And uh, and so those uh, unfamiliar with uh, there used to be a huge competitor to it called CompuServe. And oh, yeah, uh, I remember uh, that one. That's the one I had. Yeah. And so CompuServe uh, was all in the the savvy, established tech community. That's why you had it, of course. Right. (laughs) And uh, while while AOL um, was uh, was targeting the people unfamiliar with computers. So they were where they went retail versus going to the established uh, uh, market. 
and uh, and they put together this amazing marketing plan and then they actually went out there and and did this huge push and uh i i, w I wanted to play a little clip just to remind everyone uh what uh, just to kind of jog the memory of aol back then so let's quickly play this you've got mail do you remember that like that that dial tone i used to want to punch the computer back then when you when when i heard that dial tone and like it would take forever to connect i mean do you you remember like there used to not be like broadband like you could where you yeah. had internet you actually had to tie up your phone line and dial in to the internet and and get, access everything over the computer. It was it was a crazy time back then, right? Yeah, it was really tough for you when you went to your alt news groups, right, Patrick? <laughs> oh yeah, no, that was that was. <laughs> you know the different. kind I'm talking about, Patrick. And they would come up like line by line. Yeah. <laughs> the don't ASCII laugh. stars, right? Don't and, and don't don't say you don't know what I'm talking about. Buddy. I don't know what you're talking about. I have no, no clue. So yeah. uh, so uh, so anyway. Uh, let's get to the, the the meat of it. So they had this big marketing push. So do you remember these discs? I uh, do. Right? I actually remember sitting on the trading desk and someone uh, laughing about how many they send out. Like uh, it's because it was everyone. You get like three in the They're, mail every month. I think that they must have mailed like a hundred million of these discs and uh, yeah. and subsequently floppies uh, and the CDs, uh, right. and so their marketing thing is that any one that they could get with a mailing address, they would just like throw one of these in the mail and hope they download it and and use AOL. And uh, so I, I I did a quick test. I went to my existing Big Picture Trading members and I actually just went to see how many of them still have a, uh, an AOL email address. And I found two of them. Really? I still have two. I still have two members that actually okay. use an AOL email address. Can you believe that so it's still? I got even crazy. a better. I got. I got a better a stat for you, Patrick. Yeah. What's that? How many people do you think still use AOL dial-up? Oh, come on, nobody. You think so? <laughs> two point one. Two point one million Americans still use it. What? Yup. Oh, That's that was in two, yeah, that, yeah. It was in 2015, but uh, you know what? I should find a more recent one. But it's amazing. People like it's still going on your credit card, and they've just forgotten to, to get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> they just forgot to look. Yeah, uh, that's hilarious. Uh, so. Anyway, I want to get to the fun part of the story, which is, uh, so they got hot. They, they were the, just millions and millions of subscribers were pouring in, sort of like Netflix today, like people just subscribing. And uh, they became one of the dot-com sensations, right, in the 99 bubble. I, I had, at, their, at their peak, they were acquiring like Movie Phone and Netscape. Uh, and they turned around and at, at their peak in December of 99, they had a two hundred and twenty-two billion dollar market cap. Like, think about that. That's ninety-nine. That's ninety-nine, and they had a like, two hundred billion like, dollar. Like, like, you know, money still meant something. Yeah, like and that's crazy. It, it, that that's nuts, right? And yeah. so, but then that led to uh, the famous merger right. in two thousand and one. AOL, when they when things started kind of going sour and they, they lost all that momentum and, and people started to realize that there was broadband internet coming and this dial-up stuff is dead, they, they said, we have to redefine ourselves, right? And so that's when they attempted to merge, or not attempted, they did merge with Time Warner. Yeah, it, right? unbelievable. It, Just, it I was, still remember the picture of Steve Case on the stage, like, you know, with the Time Warner, Warner guy. Like yes. it was crazy. Like it was like it's it's etched. It's like seared into my mind. It's uh, so it was a three hundred and fifty billion dollar deal that today still is either mentioned as being one of the worst mergers in history, <laughs> if not widely considered one of the worst uh, in American business history of all time. <laughs> like th this this merger was a disaster.
Yeah. Uh, the 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 synergies between the two companies was brutal. Uh, AOL thought they were the shit, but yet their business was going to shit in the handbasket, and um, and so what it ended up being that it took eight years later. So this was the other date that fell into this week in trading history. It was May twenty eighth of two thousand and nine, when Time Warner spun off AOL after its eight year merger. And so it was, it was um, 10 years ago today that Time Warner spun it off and got rid of AOL. Eventually, uh, it was uh, bought by Verizon, which uh, that turned out really well. Uh, <laughs> but it was done at a remarkable market capitalization of $4.4 billion. Unbelievable, and that was in 2015, uh, and uh, and so it, the the rise and then the subsequent fall of uh, AOL, and I wonder whether like I mean, is is like Tesla gonna be this generation's uh, AOL? Like like which company is it? Netflix? Like which company is going to have that rise and was the most spectacular thing in '99, and then by a decade later was nothing. Like there, some some company is going to be that. I'd love to think of like, what what's your vote? I'm a little bit of a Tesla bear, so if yeah. I had to pick one, I'd pick Tesla. Like I I think it's uh, it'll be difficult, but who knows? You never know. Like uh, it'll be surprised. Like think about the fact that Apple, you know, 15 years ago was almost bankrupt or whatever. Like it it yeah. things change faster than people uh, imagine. That is the yeah. one thing that, that you have to remember. And we all sit here and laugh at uh, AOL Time oh. Warner. But, you know. Oh, I'm not at, laughing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are. <laughs> like, at, at the time, it seemed pretty smart. It seemed like really, you know, there's lots of, uh, they were all falling all over themselves. Uh, uh, Mark Cuban was selling his, what, what did he sell? Like, it was some crazy tech stock that he sold. Um, everyone was, yeah. everyone wanted to get into the thing, into the into this industry, and they were falling all over themselves. So it's easy to kind of uh, yeah. sit back and, and, and take pot shots at it, which is basically what we do every Friday night. But, um the reality is that uh, there's a lot of pressure on these people to own these sorts of uh, assets. And uh, in, in hindsight, it's so easy, but, uh, it, you know, it would be something, it would be very, very difficult at the time to say, I, this is for sure not going to work. And this is the yeah. one thing that I think people need to remember is that in hindsight, these trades are so obvious at the time they're not. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Well, I, you know what, though? But I'll, let's be realistic. I, like, I'll give you an example. If, if five years from now, uh, you know, let's, let's just say that the um, Tesla Q crowd ends up being right. You can't really say that people didn't see that coming. Like, I mean, there, this time around, this time around, there was a fair share of people that saw the writing on the wall. Yeah, well, Tesla, I would agree with you. There is a big community, but it, that won't end up being the one that somebody comes and buys. It'll yeah. be somebody else reaching for, you know, maybe it's uh, Apple reaching for Netflix. Maybe. And and listen, I, I was the first one to say that when uh, Facebook bought um, WhatsApp that he had overpaid. He paid a billion dollars for that app, right? Or was yeah. it Instagram? I can't remember. Regardless, it it's it. A lot of these fellows are, are and women. Because I was just laughing. I was looking at the the top three worst uh, technology takeovers, and I thought for sure that AOL Time Warner would be number one. You don't want to, but there's not. It's number two. Do you want to guess what number one is, Patrick? No, no, I don't want to guess. <laughs> HP buying uh, Compaq. Do you remember Compaq? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And that was Carly F uh, Fiorina. I can't. What was her name here? Fiorina. Yeah. That's it. Fiorina. And she bought. Con you know, that was a big, huge. Uh, that was very a huge bold deal. Play. You know, and it was it was something that was going to be very smart. And I'm sure at the time, a lot of people said it was a smart, you know, move. And and before you kind of say, well, no, no, there was lots of detractors. Don't forget, there was lots of detractors when uh, Steve Jobs decided he was going to make Apple stores. Yeah. And I was one of them. I thought that was the stupidest thing in the world. I remember going to Boston and I think there was at the time 
three or four different uh, Apple stores. And I said to my family, I said to my wife, we got to go see one of these Apple stores. This guy has gone and decided that he's going to make these stores. This is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Dell tried this. It's never going to work. I went there and I changed my mind immediately. I said, oh, my goodness. He's like he's this is a different environment. And I realized I was wrong. But there was, I, re, I still remember there was all sorts of analysts that said he was going to bankrupt the company. He was going to do the exact same thing that Dell. And here's one for you. Gateway Computers. Do you remember that? Yeah. Gateway yeah. Computers tried to make stores and they couldn't do it. Yeah. So, you know, for us to take cheap shots from the, the peanut gallery is easy, but it's hard at the time to t decide which ones are going to do well and which ones are going to do not. Well, That's do why they get paid millions, right? Yeah, well... Anyways, I, I think most of them don't work. So <laughs> I'm with you, Patrick. <laughs> All right, let's move on. So, Kev, it's time for the yeah. WTF clip of the week. Uh, shame. It's a shame. Yeah, isn't listen, it? listen. This is one of my favorite WTFs of all time. All it's right. Not, it's, not, it's not the funniest. There's no doubt about it. It's not the funniest. But I enjoyed it so much. So let's All play right. it, because uh, then we'll talk about it. Okay. When, when we look at the yield curve today, Jim, and oh. then all the, the Dallas Fed, the Chicago Fed, all these uh, points of data that some say have a recessionary whiff, right? Look, do they or don't they? I have learned to never fight the bond market, even when it's wrong. I mean, I listened to a guest sp speak on Squawk saying, look, if you're a, a German fiduciary, you're going to buy U.S. bonds. Actually, if you're any fiduciary anywhere, you'd buy U.S. bonds. Plus, the dollar keeps going higher, so it's an ideal thing. But nobody is willing to ever say the bond market's wrong. Nobody, that is, except for that idiot, Kevin Muir, who had the audacity to suggest that after a rally of 17 handles in the long bond and two Fed cuts priced into the front end of the curve, Kevin suggested that fixed income might be a sell. He was promptly and rightly chastised on Twitter for his transgression. Mother to his grace, King Tommen, widow of his grace, King Robert. She has committed the acts of falsehood. She has confessed her sins and begged for forgiveness and present herself as the gods made her to you, the good people of the city. Shame. 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 Well, I'm not even going to laugh, Kev. <laughs> no, you're laughing. I'm not laughing. <laughs> so bad. <laughs> Come on. You got to laugh, buddy. It's funny. It's, it's funny. It's funny. And you know you what? Last you, time, you, I, last you, time you I did a Game of Thrones, last time I did a Game of Thrones, I got told I had a dark sense of humor, and then I oh, shouldn't that, do you, anymore. You, you, yeah, you shouldn't do anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You so should just maybe quit. Game, I just figured that this was uh, Game of Thrones is over. I can do one last one, and I'll tell you what drove me from doing this one. As you know, I've recently gotten full on, like I put on my, uh, you know, full on grizzly suit, and I and I've decided that. Bonds are a huge sell, right? And, and and you are you are taking a lot of heat. I taking a lot of heat is is uh, an, an understatement. understatement. Yeah, I got told on Twitter what an idiot I am. <laughs> like, <laughs> there was two days of people how, telling me what what an idiot I was, and you know what? Usually, you know, you know, say, you know I, what's oh, amazing. Usually, it's, it's just, only Friday night for two and a half hours, but now I had to listen to it for two days. <laughs> Well, listen, I, I am, I am a long-term bond bull uh, uh, you, uh, and obviously Dave yes. shared his opinion with, uh, with you and that somehow long dated treasuries should be 10%. You guys can have your little daydreaming session together. And, uh, but the, it's gotten a little crazy. Like, yeah. uh, uh, you know what, like, Whenever everybody is in agreement on something, you have to be sometimes a little bit worried, right? For sure. 
and so listen, before we start, I have to say hats off to you. You've been bullish and you've been correct. Um, I guess the stop clock I, I mean, is right yeah, twice, like, a, twice, exactly. a, twice a day. So, um, yeah. but and, and and to be fair to me, when uh, Gunlack, oh, I shouldn't have said his name. I did. Well, we're not going to edit that out. We'll just leave it. When Gunlack said his two closes above three and a quarter, and then you should sell it. Would well, you remember what I said? Uh, you you called bullshit on it. Yeah, and I was like, I, I, you know, I, I think I wrote something to the effect that even though I am a long-term bear, the, the amount of bearishness in the market meant that you had to go the other way. Well, it pretty well... Uh, it took the top. Yeah, it took the top, and we had in the next six months or five months since then, we've been straight up. Yeah. And what I think is funny now, and I, I posted a, a tweet the other day that said, well, I guess if after two consecutive closes below two and a quarter, should I buy it? Like it's like it's it, it's. Did funny you get any because, likes? I don't think you got well, any likes. No. I don't know if anyone got my joke, but um, <laughs> <laughs> the the reality is that that bonds That's don't you. trade nice and sweet and and trend. They they are uh, a very much a, a counter cyclical choppy movement market. And when everyone goes one way, and I saw something the other day that said something about the fact that the bull uh, reading was ninety one percent. Yeah. And and when I get people telling me I am this much of an idiot, I just felt like, oh, just yeah, you're it, like it you're just, like the dark lord in uh, in Star Wars. You just yeah. like feed let the, the hate flow the through you. Oh, yeah. Like you're 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 just soaking this up. Well, you know what? Look, I, I actually am just I'm going to wait for a dip and I'm going back into bonds. But but it, I'll agree with you on one thing is, is that this has gotten pretty heated here and uh, and. I think that there's a little, well, there's plenty of room for mean reversion and all these weak hands that are chasing to be washed out of their uh, their chase. Yeah, listen, I could be wrong. I'm wrong. Yeah, all you, the time, you could, yeah. as you know, yeah. as you know, um, there's no doubt about it. I just think that at this stage, uh, you have to remember that a lot of people were pretty sure at three and a quarter that we were going to continue going down. Not me. And those but same well. I can't remember if you were or not. You were, yeah, that's right, because you were bullish. So you 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 were yeah. offside a long way from that point. So you were just praying it would stop going down. Um, at at this point, I think you know we've we've gone 17 handles higher on the on the long bond. We've got two uh, Fed uh, cuts priced in over the next year. Yeah, you guys could be right. It could get a lot worse, but the the odds like at this point the risk reward does not favor getting long yeah. you need the you need sh like stuff to go really south and really bad to make money from it's here. And, and exactly that, that, there's no yeah. asymmetry at this moment there is well, no asymmetry there i think they would i think that the bond bulls just uh, if i would put their hats on they would say the world is all at zero the u.s is still two and a quarter we're headed to zero that's and what I would say, but I just don't think it's going to happen all at once, right? Like yeah. this is this is. I think it's just like there, there has not been enough deterioration in my mind for us to already uh, be pricing in this big of a move. Yeah, and I I contend that we could get a situation where the economy turns south and it doesn't turn south enough to justify the already easy monetary policy that's priced in. And even though the economy is going, uh, you know, getting weaker, bonds are going down. Yeah. And and listen, I just want to say one last thing. I, I saw the other day that, you know, you, you've you been bullish on bonds. And uh, another big bull, bond bull has been Raul Paul. Right. And he's been really, he's been right. And he was, and, and to be fair, he was standing out there all alone. And I saw something, someone asked him for his comment, and he was the nicest, most gentlemanly guy. And he said, and, and I wish that more people would realize that it, like that uh, they should be like this fellow because he said, you know, everyone has different time frames and we can both be right. And, uh, you know, that's in essence, he said, that's what makes a market. And uh, I, you know, hats off to him. And thanks, Raul, because like, I appreciate that. And I think that when you and I disagree, I don't go tell you, you know, well, I do tell you, but, I, uh, you know, our listeners, I don't tell them what idiots they are for going the other side of me. I'm actually just happy they're on the other side of my trades. And if you think I'm wrong, so be it. Uh, you should be happy that I'm there. 
uh, taking the other side of your trade because if I wasn't, that would mean the bonds would already be you know one percent or whatever. If everyone like me, if there was nobody taking the other side of your trades, then there would be nobody to you know when I when I'm forced to cover, because that's what yeah. you're going to say. I have to buy it back, and you you know you know you're going to want to sell it to me when I'm so wrong. So you should be happy about it. <laughs> <laughs> and and I think that more people should take that that kind of in in their uh, heart of hearts they should remember that, and uh, we I wrote that piece in the Macro Tourist about meet you in the machine, and I was just kind of always thankful that there's someone on the other side of my trades and that there's someone to trade with. So yep. I, I just want every to remind everyone that there's no reason to be so uh, so mean out there. <laughs> Please have mercy on Kevin. No. Okay. okay. All right. Anyway, I'm okay, but I just think it's funny. I All actually right. really do think it's funny because I've taken Patrick. I've taken more heat and gotten told that I am such an idiot on this one trade that I've ever taken, and it's and it's been shocking to me. And I and I'm and I hope you guys are right. Like so, you know, you might very well be right. But when everyone is so keen on telling me what an idiot I am, I would be, you know, careful worried and i'd be careful if, if i were you guys because that's not the kind of environment that you want to that is is uh showing a risk reward that is is positive in your favor yeah there's uh there's that famous bill farrell statement uh, i'm paraphrasing because i don't know exactly how it goes but it's like when everybody is in consensus almost always something different happens right and yeah. uh and it, this is slowly growing now to being a pretty consensus view right yeah and it's uh anyway let's move on kev it's time for the top five things to watch next week but uh before we do why don't we just fire through and talk about uh, what we thought were the things to watch uh last week and uh, so on number five, we were talking about this defensives versus cyclicals, but really the selling this week um, has brought down the defensives and the cyclicals together. I mean, the defensives, even the utilities got hammered pretty hard here this week. Yeah, it was a weird action because yeah. even though bonds were ripping to the upside um, earlier in the week, we saw the XLU rallying, but then look at it 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 kind of ticked yeah. at new highs at 60 bucks and and just shit the bed for the last three days yeah uh, well i mean two uh, it dropped two dollars right i mean it's, it's a, but it's a pretty nasty two-day drop there's no doubt about that right yeah. like I well mean, it's it, even it, more nasty considering uh, that four, bonds four, four are still drop. sitting near highs yeah well i mean there's the bond proxy, but I think what's happening here is, is there's just a, an equity sell going on here, right? I think, I think at at some point when you start getting into a more broader liquidity uh, sell cycle, then it's not about uh, sector rotation; it becomes just about raising cash. And then, but then don't you think that Excel XLU um, underperformed even considering? Yep. It's, like, it, like it, you, it, that was that was a shit run for the last two days. There's nothing, no other way to put it. So, so here I have a question for you, Patrick. Does the fact that XLU and the Staples, the fact that they did so bad, is that saying that we're almost over, or is that saying that the the selling is just gonna just started in the stock market? Now you're you're kind of cornering me there. Like I look, I I do continue to believe in my bigger view that we have uh, we're in a bear market. Uh, and that and that there's going to be a lot more selling to come. But with that said, uh, I don't think it all just like the bond market. I don't think it all comes in one big shot. I don't think we've we're oversold enough in the markets yet for the selling to be done on the very short term. But I would not be surprised if if in the in the coming week or two we hit some sort of a tradable bottom, and then we're going to have some counter trend back up. That's going to get the bulls all excited again. I mean, that's what the market does all the time, right? And right. and um, and so I, I don't think that this is going to just crash straight down, and we're just going to go and uh, and bleed out uh, with you know breaking December lows by uh, by July first type of thing, right? Well, Dave will be disappointed to hear that you don't. Think that. <laughs> <laughs> well, come on, we have all year to get down there, right? <laughs> okay, <laughs> right, number oil. Four. Wow, yeah. it just keeps breaking, eh? The, yeah, inv totally. the ADP numbers kind of popped it, and then we, everyone found out that that was not really a, a good number, and then and then they just hammered it this morning, 
like um, I'm going to bring this onto a one hour chart, but like uh, when yeah. actually we should tell everyone we're taping this Thursday night. Yes. Yes. That's this right. is, this is Thursday evening on uh, May 30th and um, yeah. And they got hammered, right? Like that's a, that's a crazy drop. Uh, the, uh, the oil markets, uh, it broke to a lower low. And uh, I mean, at this stage, uh, as a technician, right? What what do technicians do when we break to lower lows, Kev? You sell it. <laughs> Thank you. So we have a sell signal, right? No, but <laughs> yeah, just Gunlock is telling you he sold the lower lows at three and a quarter too. Yeah, uh, but uh, but it I it is interesting. But this kind of fifty seven fifty eight dollar level on oil to me was a, was an important line for the bulls to hold and uh, the, this selling opens up low 50s like I mean I don't I would not be shocked if we we're 55 53 here this week uh, not, maybe not this week but by middle of next week and okay whoa whoa so you got can't just say shit like that you got to back it up so uh, next week when we do this a, a week from Friday higher or lower lower okay I'll take higher yeah okay yeah Okay, listen, we'll put it. Okay, okay, on. no, no, but but okay, but so but you got to give me a caveat. If we basically hit fifty three and then rally by the end of that week back above, uh, let's say fifty eight, then I wasn't wrong. No, listen, you're like uh, I can't remember which president says. I oh want Jesus, a one a one armed economist because they always say on the other hand. You can't say that. It's not a, like a knockout I, option. Look, I think that we're going down to 55 <laughs> to 53. Just, uh, do, get, do, oh, no, let, let's out, make the bet. No, the, no, here's the bet. By next week, are we, uh, when we're taping the show, are we going to see 55 to 53? Are you taking the other side of that trade? Well, okay. Uh, so how many dollars is that off? We're at 56 and a half. Okay. And you're saying... So I, I'm... I'm I'm saying we're going down to 55 to 53. So we're, uh, so we're on, I'm talking that we're dropping down a, a minimum, or let's say two bucks lower. So you, you, I have to give you the knockout option at that tick, but then I get everything. Like, so if it goes at 54 and a half, I win. No, I have 55. No, I have 55. 55, 53. To I thought you said 53 to half, buddy. But now you're changing your story. I said 50, I said 53 to 55. No, I know, but you're. Th we got to take the lower amount. Okay. You're give 50, okay. I'll option. give you. I'll give you fifty-four fifty. <laughs> Patrick, you're like the worst better. Let's go on to the next thing. <laughs> go price out that <laughs> knockout option, buddy, and you figure out what that's worth. Because like nobody's gonna sell you that shit, buddy. Okay. Let's okay. Stop. Oh, stop. Stop for a second. Stop okay, for a second. Okay. No, we, we have a bet. We have a bet going here. Look, <laughs> you're saying it's okay. F forget. It. I'm gonna play your game. What are we gonna do? A Duke and Duke here? No, we're gonna do a burger, and it's gonna be fifty-three. So if uh, I it, all it has to do, all it has to do is touch that, Patrick. Yeah, it but I, I've, I've only got a week. Okay, okay. Fifty-three right. and a half. Quickly. Fifty-three we'll and a half. A, yes, fifty-three and a half burger. Okay, done. done. There you done. go. Done. All right. Okay. So number three. Number three. Bank of Canada. Uh, they were more hawkish than expected, weren't it, they? It was actually shocking. They don't right. seem to be uh, changing their attitude at all, considering the fact that real estate in Canada is. Uh, it's Shouldn't definitely slowing down. Yeah, it's it's slowing down. It's problems and Pol Polas Polas. How do I say Polos. that? Anyways, he j he just he's continuing on with his hawkish rhetoric. Like, you know I what? Just, I'm shocked. So so I want to go to a variant perception piece, but they put a blog out basically saying short CAD on structural and cyclical risks to Canada, and they're like pointing out all sorts of interesting stats. Uh, you know, like everything from the percentage of the uh, inverted segments of the Canadian yield curve to all sorts of different things. But like the truth is like the Canadian market is getting pretty toppy uh, yeah. and uh, the stock market isn't, but because it's mostly manifesting in the currency, at least initially. Uh, but uh, I, I'm, I'm bearish Canada. I think you should sell the Canadian banks and buy the U.S. banks. I think that's a great trade. Yeah, I, I, that, like that's that. been that's been your story for like a year. Yeah, now. Yeah, I, I continue. Like I think it's about to take off. And the other thing I think you should do is own um, short dated uh, backs futures. Even mm. though I am a bear in the U.S., I, I'm a I'm a bull on those. I think that spread. I continue to think that spread's going to work. So yeah. far, it hasn't. It seems to be that everybody uh, is convinced that the Fed is going to cut twice more and uh, that we're going to see all sorts of pronounced weakness in the U.S. 
if we're going to see economic weakness in the U.S., well, we're going to see way more weakness in yeah. Canada. And yeah. it's going to be ugly. On so, a relative basis, for uh, sure. I, I think the markets have, have gotten out of sync in terms of what they expect in the U.S. versus what they expect in Canada. Right, right. Okay, so number two, we were talking the U.S. GDP number that came in uh, in a little bit lower. I mean, 3.1 was uh, the expectation, and it kind of came in there. Um, I mean, I, th I think that I, I'm in the Lacey Hunt camp, which is that s growth continues to slow generally. Uh, and I don't necessarily think it has to be outright recessionary at this moment, but I still think it's going to slow. But I mean, uh, that wasn't anything impressive. Do you have any comment on it? I'm just wondering if uh, Mrs. Macro or Mrs. Big Picture Trading took down your Lacey Hunt posters yet. No, she has not. No. And by the way, survey was actually 3% for the growth and it came out at 3.1. So it was actually above uh, really? Expectations. What, yeah. what there, I, I saw that the uh, expectation was 3.1. So maybe we're just. Well, I'm different. showing that Bloomberg was. 3%. Oh, I'm Bloomberg's the authority. Or sorry, never mind. <laughs> okay, so, so, so number one. China manufacturing PMI, but we're recording this before it actually came out. We had to record early. I'm on the road for uh, to, to Montreal to do the options education day out there. And so uh, we're recording this er a day early. And so we haven't seen those manufacturing numbers. So we maybe we'll circle back and just mention them next week. How's that sound? Sounds good. All right. So let's move on. So, Kev, it's time for the top five things to watch next week. So let's uh, start off with number five. Now, it's uh, I, we just wanted to mash them together just because we didn't want to have two PMI numbers taking up all five slots. So you know, really what it was, in, uh, we have the U.S. manufacturing PMI numbers. Curious whether or not that's going to come in a little bit weaker than expected. Uh, but then, of course, there's Italy, right? And... Uh, and I'm ver I'm curious whether uh, things are going to deteriorate over there. Do you have an opinion? I think that Europe is going to continue to shit the bed. They just they um, yeah. even though I, I understand the I the idea that there's a lot of pessis pessimism baked into the uh, European markets. Yeah, I just don't see them changing their 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 path, and I don't think we can get that until we see a change in attitude with the government. And yeah. we had Guy Harris talking to us about Greece and how they become more investor friendly and changing their policies. But so far, the rest of Europe is continuing on with uh, very, I don't know, poor policies with their extreme monetarism and fiscal austerity. And I just don't think it's going to work. So even yeah. though you might get a blipper, one, uh, you know, one or two months where it blips up, I'm just still a seller until yeah. I see that change in attitude. I'm not going to get excited. Yeah. And so uh, with the U.S. PMI, we've been on a general trajectory lower, which is essentially the rate of change has been negative. I mean, we, we had uh, the U.S. manufacturing PMIs up at uh, in 2018 up in the 60 range. Right. And so with us uh, edging down to like 52, it, it's in a downwards trajectory. So I don't think it's going to go uh, below 50, which is uh, the recessionary numbers. But it'll be interesting to see whether this comes in below expectation. Yeah, where do you, what's what's your uh, well? Intuition? I think the official uh, the official expectation is probably a lot different than the whisper number. I will what's say what's the that, whisper number. I don't know what the whisper number is, but I'm guessing it's lower than the survey. What do you think? Because so, there's right? a lot of bears out there, a lot of people. I think. Well, I, you the, can see that in the you can see that in the bond market, right? Like you know, right. It's so I I I think it would have to be a pretty big miss for the bond bulls to actually be able to get the the bond market up on it. So do you think do you think that this might be a catalyst? Like, do you think that this no. could be the, no, no? But that's Not, that's no. me. I just I don't think it's as bad as you guys think it is. No, no, so no. But I, I'm talking about a catalyst for bonds in terms of the fact that everyone realizes that they've gotten ahead of themselves. Like, what if the number? Oh, a catalyst the other way. Yeah. No, because I don't think we're gonna actually pot. Like, I guess if if all of a sudden there was a freakly strong number then um, maybe it could be a catalyst, but I don't think that that's the case. The bond market is correct that the economy is slowed down. The only question is how much is slowed down and whether yeah. that's enough to justify the current pricing. I'm not disagreeing with the direction of the bond market. I'm disagreeing with the extent of the bond market. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, you know, I don't, I don't foresee this being some sort of catalyst that causes a, a dramatic repricing. I mean, yeah. And I still think, wouldn't it be funny would uh, here's a question I have for you, Patrick. 
How much do you think the bond market would gap down if Trump all of a sudden signed a trade deal, a China deal? Oh, it certainly think, would gap down. I don't know if I would ha- want to uh, offer you a guess, but it, yeah. cer- it certainly would be um, a blow to the bonds. And I and I understand right now nobody is thinking that. Everybody is thinking that it's getting worse, and I'm not denying that in the least. But yeah. at this point, that what's priced in is is a continued deterioration in the in the U.S. trade talks. Yeah. And and yeah. it's funny we're ta- we're taping this on Thursday. And I see that Pence just leaked something about uh, he's going to do a speech and he's going to talk about how, the fact that they could double the tariffs easily. Yeah. So wow. there's no doubt it continues to get worse and worse and worse. But here's a question I have for you, Patrick. Why, <laughs> just so why, many why, questions today. I know. So, <laughs> so, so many questions. Why do you think that tariffs are deflationary? Uh on the sh- uh, on a transitory basis, they're inflationary. Oh, okay. So the bond market is just so much smarter, and they're seeing past that. Uh, well, I mean, look, but uh, but at the same time, I think that there's offsets, right? Like, for instance, so the, so yes, there's going to be a rise in the cost of goods because the tariffs are going to pump that. But I think there's a reflexivity in the market I and mean, the rising dollar, and and there'll, there'll be a much uh, uh, the PBOC is going to let the uh, Chinese uh, won uh, um, uh, fall lower. There's going to be all sorts of things that are going to bring. Uh, to, there's going to mute the impact. Is if you so, if you are looking at it purely in isolation, right? So Patrick, what I love about you deflationists, how you talk about how globalization is deflationary, and then how anti-globalization is deflationary. I never said. For sure. Are you telling me that globalization isn't deflationary? Well, uh, take, uh, yes, taking advantage of labor uh, <laughs> around the world is, yes. So yes. I love it. It's all just deflationary. Just it's all bonds. deflationary. Yes, just there buy you bonds. Go. All right. You the heard only it. question is, You're, you heard it right here on the huddle, right from Patrick. Yeah. Just buy yeah. bonds. It's, it's that simple. <laughs> Number four, let's talk about the grains, dude. What yeah, well, the you hell? Know. You you we had we had Angie on, right? Oh, and so listen, she, I've been meaning to give her a big shout out because what did Angie tell us? Do you remember? I'm asking it's you going a lot higher. Of questions. Yeah, no, no, no listen. But, no, but she, she, which she one did calling. she say? Well, she did love corn and but she also yes. was totally she thought uh, wheat was going with the five five fifty, right? But the what goddess was, what of was, grain loved the corn over everything else. Yes. And go look at which commodity, which grain is leading this rally. Oh yeah. Well this is crazy. It's all corn. This so hats off crazy. to you, Angie. Like hats yeah. off. Well done. You called this. It was a great play. Sure, it was looking scary there for a little while for you. It was twenty seven percent. In it's less a huge than rally. a month, in huge less rally, than a month. and and for a while, corn was doing the worst, and I'm sure she took all. No, sorts it wasn't of flack. soya bean. Soya bean was the no, worst. No, no, I think corn was actually uh, soybeans on a percentage basis. I think corn was pretty bad. Well, you mean so for I'm that sure, two day little I'm drop? Sure, I'm sure Angie had a lot of. Uh, she had to walk the. She had to do her walk of atonement as well. Oh come on! Look at this soya bean drop right here. Uh, in the in the month of April, there that was like a twelve percent drop. Corn. Did okay, not go drop. do corn. Right here, like nothing, dude. That was like Go a do seven, it. seven, nine percent drop. Even off okay. of here, it was nine it was versus twelve. But anyways, anyways, uh, point is, Angie did a great call. Loved, yes. it, loved the goddess of grain. Well done. Yeah. Question for you: Do we go higher? Uh, well, this is now parabolic. I don't know. This feels very natural gas. Like, I don't no idea. Like, uh, like when, when yeah, the, uh, so somebody's getting squeezed on this. I, I wonder how many of those, uh, naked call writers are up here saying yeah. that cor- a core never goes up. Like this is somebody's getting shafted for sure on this, uh, on this rise on the other side of this. Right. And so the, this move, it's huge. Like uh, at this stage, I honestly think there'll be a, I think that I think there's going to be a mean reversion after this. I think it's, this is a liquidity event that's going to wash everyone out that has to get washed out up, and then it's going to mean revert. But I think we stay above 400. I think I, I think that um, I think that this is not going back to the lows. That's for sure. I think you should be careful about playing this market for twenty dollars, like selling it oh. because you think it's going back. You know, you're going to get a twenty dollar dip. Even today, like I thought it was, it had rolled over and we almost closed at the highs. Yeah. Co- grains are so cheap on a, a real basis. 
their all time lows adjusted for inflation. Yeah. It's just dumb. Like it's just dumb. And nobody can make any money down here at these prices. And if we get a situation where they actually get bad weather, because for the past like three or four years, we've had perfect weather every single time. It's been perfect weather. If we yeah. got a situation where we had bad weather, then you wouldn't be just talking four and a half dollars on corn. It would be back up into like eight, uh, nine bucks without blinking. And I'm not yeah. saying that we're for sure going there. But be careful. I wouldn't short that with my, you know, worst enemy's money. <laughs> well, you know, it's another market that was moving. Uh, we were talking grains. And so uh, let me quickly show wheat so you can see that wheat moved. Uh, I'm going to quickly show this pop, but it, not as much as corn. Corn's the one that's getting the, all the action on a relative basis. But uh, what's interesting is the little uptick that's happened in coffee. Uh, and uh, so the American breakfaster is the one that's getting the short end of the stick right now uh, as uh, as their breakfast cereals and coffee are all uh, upticking here and it's going to translate to a little bit higher prices. But what uh, but coffee is you think this is a change in trend here? Do you have do you have any insight here? I, I know even less about coffee than I do about corn. That doesn't stop me from trading these stupid things. But um I, I looked at all the softs and I thought to myself that they're bottoming. And I thought it was kind of interesting that the bond market was screaming, thinking that we were going to get this deflationary impulse. Right. Meanwhile, the commodities for the past week have been trading well or, or you know, past week and a half. Yeah. And I look at these and I think to myself, mm, maybe these guys are a little ahead of the bond market and we're in yeah. the final stages of the blow off on the bonds. And I, I, I know you can't get the CRB raw industrials index. And that's been one of the ones that I've been most worried about because it's not subject to the same sort of speculation and move that we see in all these traded ones. But it stopped going down and it also bottomed and started to stabilize. And I, I kind of think that that's important. And, and I'm watching it for clues that uh, as in terms of timing of the next move higher. Right, right. Well, you know what? It's definitely something our uh, listeners should be watching. It's it's um, it's getting hot. It's it's happening. So, but let's go number three, Deutsche Bank. You just uh, wanted to put this in here because you wanted to get some burns. No, listen, on me. listen. You have already conceded. We've had That's this right. conversation. I already walk. I did my walk of atonement you, for this you one did. a while ago. I, I don't even want to shame you anymore because you've already <laughs> shame, you shame, you've you've shame. all no, but you've already admitted your wrongs, and I yes. I am I'm not going to go and fl uh, flog you again, <laughs> but. But I think it's crazy that it keeps breaking down. Like now, you know, we, we tend to cover a lot of U.S. equities. But here, let me put, let's show this um, DBK. I'm going to show it in, in the uh, German market right here. But what you have here is Deutsche Bank breaking basically down towards six euros, right? It's uh, you're, you, this thing is on full sell mode. And, you, you know, I've heard many, many people talk about how systemically important Deutsche Bank is. And I don't think that Germany would ever allow Deutsche Bank to fail the way Lehman Brothers failed. Uh, but are, are we going to see uh, some sort of a deal here? Like, is this thing, are equity uh, traders going to get wiped on this and then they're going to recapitalize this thing? I don't have a clue, but I do believe that a lot of the rally in the U.S. fixed income has been driven out of Europe. And I ask you to bring up the German tens. Yeah, okay. Because I think that that has been what to watch oh, yeah. for why we've got such a rally in U.S. Ten, it, it, the US. We're back to 2016 lows, minus yeah. 17 basis points on the 10-year. That's just bad shit crazy. No, no, what's crazy is that all of that shit that's happening in Italy has not even moved the needle on that 10-year Italian bond. Like, like, I mean, I know that Zero Hedge likes to kind of always like every uptick on the thing, but we have not seen um, um, uh, um, a, even a reaction on the, uh, the Italian tenure. Yeah, it, it, it's money markets over there stopped working. Like people just like, well, it's not if you're that. bullish, they've been working just fine. Well, <laughs> come on. Negative 16 <laughs> basis points in a tenure. No, like nobody. See, this is, is where this is where you and Dave can like talk about your ten year, uh, sorry, ten percent yields on long bonds. Look, 
we are not in a uh, free trading bond market anymore. We're in the financial repression that's going on is for there for a reason because of the debt. We're not. This is not going away. Uh, we are going to see these kind of low and negative interest rates for a long time until there's some sort of a, a break in the system. I don't know what that break is. Maybe you're going to be right when, when that happens. But I'll tell you, I wouldn't want to be around when that shit starts hitting the fan. Okay, well, there you yeah. go. Anyway, let's let's go to number. But by the way, just quickly on Deutsche Bank before we go on, though, do you think uh, the, this the bleeding just keeps going? You have no I have no opinion except to say this is what I'm watching for in Europe. The moment that the governments stop trying to fix their problems with monetary uh, easing and more and more negative rates and instead realize that they have to address the fiscal side, I am a seller of all things European. The moment including they change the euro, their attitude, including the euro, yeah, okay. I, and, and and the moment they change their attitude and become more Trump-like in that they cut taxes, don't worry about deficits, and actually raise rates. Like I'd like to see them raise rates. Yeah. I think rates should be higher. I think that they should put rates immediately to zero and sp and allow the deficits to grow, in yeah. terms of the federal on the federal side. Until I see that. I just think we're going to have continued pain and it's going to be like the Japan uh, lost decade. And I refuse to get involved until I see that change. All right. Well, number two, we're, it was the ECB monetary statement, but I don't think you have anything else to say other than what you just ranted. Uh, I think we just, I think we just, uh, uh, I think you just uh, kind of. No, but I think two. it'll be interesting to see. You know, if people get excited because they cut rates even more negatively, you just, you know, sold to them because right. it's not going to work. The ECB is not the problem. Well, it's the problem. The problem is that they continue to try to fix it and they are unable to fix it. And the ECB won't be able to do it. And it needs to be done out of Brussels. And, right. and that's all Brussels and Germany. And, and, and so th as they continue to try to fix it with all their crazy policies, just avoid, avoid, avoid. Oh, you know what? I do remember this one uh, guy that used to be super bullish Europe, but like a year I ago. I completely agree. And then I and then I kind of uh, I had my uh, my come to Jesus moment where I realized <laughs> about how the mon or the modern, um, you know, financial system works under, you know, this current environment of a fiat system and how QE doesn't it can't spark. Quantitative easing can't spark inflation. You can't yeah. do it with just monetary policy. And yeah. that is the part that I've realized, and that's why I changed my tune. All right. Number one, the jobs numbers, right? So I think this is – so you asked me if there was uh, something that would be a catalyst. This could be it. And, and I, I think the job numbers are the most important things to watch. Really? I think it's amazing as well that the, that the U.S. Uh, of, uh, kind of short end of the curve is pricing in two – Basis cuts points. right now. Two cuts, yeah. Like yeah. two 56, cuts. 56 basis points. Yeah, cuts. In, the, in the next year. Yeah. And we still have not had, like, just pull up the weekly uh, unemployment numbers. Oh, like uh, our, our jobless claims, jobless claims. Oh, I don't, I don't been, have any easy access to it. Anyways, yeah, there's crazy. been no signs of any sorts of problems in the job market yet. For the Okay, for the, but, but in fairness, though, Kev. Uh, yep. There are there are a lot of situations where the jobs numbers don't start getting hit till after the recession is confirmed. Like there's a lag. There's no there's nothing leading about jobs numbers. There they, they tend to only uptick once the uh, once the the recession is inevitable. You you think that there's no there's none like they're they're sitting at all time. I'm lows not saying as... I'm. I uh, they. they from at least the data that I've seen from a number of charts, the the jobs numbers don't have a leading indicator element. No, I, I I would agree that there's no leading. They are definitely a lagging indicator, but I I would think that given how bad the bear, the economic bears think it's out there, like I I would expect it could be a catalyst. No, 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 it could be a yeah. catalyst. I'm not going to deny that, but I'm yeah. just saying that I think anybody that's watching these job numbers, waiting for that uptick in unemployment, uh, so, uh, by the time we get that uptick, we'll already be probably have started the recession. Like one, I mean, that would be a vindication to the bond uh, bulls for sure if we started seeing it because that would be just confirmation 
that shit's hitting the fan much quicker than everyone's expecting. I'm not that bearish. I'm bearish, but I'm not that bearish. Like, I think that uh, I feel that we're going to see recessions around the world kicking in long before the U.S. falls. The U.S. will be one of the last countries to fall into a recession in my mind. And um, and and therefore, I think that the U.S. jobs numbers will actually surprisingly uh, hold in for at least uh, an, another quarter or two. We'll see. Okay. Well, there you go. Yeah. Anyway, we'll we'll see. Anyway, that's the top five things for our listeners to watch next week. So, Kev, um, we don't. Ha- oh, do we do have a, a, a yeah, parting? Yeah, for sure. We have a parting wisdom. <laughs> Patrick, that's my job. I always get this. There's no way I'd miss this. So I, I actually, this one comes back to my uh, rudimentary uh, understanding of uh, the uh, squiggles. Okay. And I, I go back to Richard Dennis because Richard Dennis is one of the great trend followers out there. And I kind of consider trend following. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it shouldn't be considered technical analysis. Like, what do you think? I think trend following is an important part of technical analysis. Are you right? But uh, but you don't think that we're in a trend on the S and P? Yeah, just uh, the, there's uh, every trend ends with a topping formation. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I guess I just missed that part. So I, I think Richard Dennis. Actually, I really I really uh, respect him and think he's a very interesting character. He's from the floor in the in the seventies and eighties, and he was the fellow that came up with the trading turtles. And they, uh, the, him and his partner had a, a bet that they could train people to trade. Yeah. And they said something to the effect like, we'll train them just like turtles. I don't know why turtles now that I think yeah. about it. Why, why are tr- I have no turtles trained? Anyways, I think that he was just, someone had come from a turtle farm and had seen them. Anyways, so they were called the turtles and they ended up being doing extremely well and they were all trend followers. And there's some people to some extent, uh, they, they, attribute their success to the fact that they were trading in a period of inflation when when there was lots of trends that were higher and higher and higher and some people can you know talk about that i i think that trend following does work i think that it is a it is a difficult strategy to keep or to follow because from an emotional point of view it's difficult to buy you know new highs it, it it's tough for you, especially if you're already long. You just want to sell it. You want to take. So profits. wait a second. So if if uh, it makes new highs, you buy. Yeah. So on trend followers. And for if sure. it, if it makes a new low, you sell. For sure. That's what trend followers would argue. I, that I, sounds I, so I, much like the shit that you give me for technical analysis. I, you're you're absolutely right. It does sound like that. And it what does they a do, little bit of an echo. Uh, for sure. And that's why I was always confused why you weren't <laughs> buying the new highs in the S and P. But um, the, the, the I let's go back to one of uh, Richard's lines, and he says, "I could always, I always said you could publish rules in a newspaper, and no one would follow them. The key is consistency and discipline." Yeah. And even though we're talking about trend following, there this applies in so many more ways than just that. Whether it's day trading, whether it's fundamental analysis, whatever it is. If you, the moment you start to make excuses for your rules and you start saying this time is different or, you know, what this stop, I'm going to let go longer because I'm sure about it, or I'm going to trade this bigger. You're just on you're you've started, you've done, you've entered down the road of your, of, of failure. Yeah. You know, and I love know, that the key is dis- consistency and discipline. So, so uh, I, I completely agree with this. One, uh, even though I, uh, I come across very heavily as an option buyer and a market timer buying and selling, uh, I come from when, when I was working at the banks, um, from uh, uh, working with a portfolio manager doing option selling. And I spent a large part of my uh, career premium harvesting, just selling premium. And when you're when you know, when we had Adam on the show just um, last week and he was showing that the, his hedging things, it's the reciprocal. If you think about it, is this idea of just harvesting premium by just selling insurance or uh, sell, uh, selling the premium out there. And it's about consistency and discipline. You just have to go in there and just harvest the premium on an ongoing basis. And you just have to be consistent and you have to be disciplined and do the same thing over again once you fi- feel you have an edge, right? And uh, and that's such a key to being good at trading. 
Right. And, and the problem with the people that are selling vol or selling premium, as you say, they often, when it starts to go against them, they, they freeze or they don't deal with it. And, uh, like optionsellers.com, we were laughing about him, but we, I remember going back to that episode. He, we figured it out. He could have covered lots of times and not zeroed his account. Yeah. It went against him and he didn't take the loss. The first loss is the best loss. And people have to remember that. Yeah. And I, I think there's so many different ways to make money out there. And although we kid ourselves, you know, kid each other about different, about our market views. One of the things that we have to remember is that we can both be right. Yeah. And, and, and we can both make money in the market. It doesn't mean that just because you have a view that this is going to happen or I have a view that that's going to happen. A lot of times it's how you execute that and how you trade that around with your different risk profiles and your different strategies that means way more than than your idea. Yeah. And I, I kind of laugh because I, I, I have a friend that talks to me about Jim Rogers and he says, Jim Rogers, if you ever listen to that guy, he's always wrong. And I say, yeah, you know what? He might always be wrong, but yet the guy's worth like hundreds of millions of dollars. So my suspicion is he might not be the greatest at, at calling stuff, but I suspect that he has a very, very strict risk discipline of some sort. And he really does know how to manage money, which is completely different. And and too often people think that they, they're, they're one and the same and they're not. Right, right. Oh, you know what? Words of wisdom from uh, Richard Dennis. I I agree with that. So, Kev, it's uh, it's that part of the show where we have to wrap things up. So obviously, we still have our uh, after hours show where uh, Dave's gonna uh, join us and we're gonna uh, uh, discuss some uh, more fun stuff because I think you're gonna get, circle back to uh, some uh, MMT with him, aren't you? That's right. Dave it's is a uh, very colorful character. I always enjoy talking to him. He's uh, he's a lot of fun, and he's not one to hold back. All right. Well, listen, those of you that are ending here, well, thank you for uh, taking the time out to uh, to join us. Now, if you um, uh, uh, do want to register on our website, we can get the weekly email to give you the update, which includes the chart book, so you can see all the different charts we talked about throughout the presentations, uh, and to give you the updates as to when our new shows are coming out. Uh, as well, uh, if you want to follow us, uh, you can follow uh, uh, our uh, Twitter handle, the market huddle uh, and you can also follow uh, myself at Patrick Ceresna and Kevin at Kevin Muir and uh, otherwise is there any other closing remarks we had Kev no that's it I, it's been a it's been a lot of fun Patrick and have a great time in Montreal La Belle Provence oh well, I will it's gonna be a great weekend I'm gonna actually meet up with uh, Aiden uh, and uh, oh. so I'm going to have a, a pint with them and talk some macro. It's going to be pretty good and, and meet up a, l a bunch of our listeners at the Options Education Day. So it's going to be uh, a lot of fun out there. Well, that's great. Say hi to everyone in Quebec for me. Take care. Right. Thanks a lot. Have a great weekend, everyone. Okay, thanks for sticking around. Now we get Dave in his full-on after hours, uh, no holds barred. He's going to tell me how it really is. And Dave, before we start, I, I must say that, you know, our politics don't um, align, shall we say. I, I think that you and uh, Patrick are much more similar. But one of the things that I really, really uh, respect and enjoy about your Twitter is how you're open to different ideas and you're not you're not telling everyone how they should live their lives and you truly believe in free speech and uh i i, I must say hats off to you because i actually I, I i love following you and i love hearing the different points of view and i enjoy it i think more people in the world should be like you kind of willing to listen to the other side well uh yeah thank you that's that's a, quite a compliment um yeah one time i gave speech at, at, at a, at a uh, graduation. It was 300 people in the room or something. It, it was really funny, the timing. I, I, I forget it. That's a long story. I'll let that go. <laughs> Let's move to the next topic. Okay. So listen, are you, I know you're being a little bit of an outspoken critic of MMT. So here you go. I, I probably... I'm a little more sympathetic to you than, than than you, let's say. So why did you go ahead and uh, let's let's have a little chat about it? So do you think it's uh, as dumb and as as kind of foolish as as everybody claims? Uh, all the the hard right wingers think. 
Well, um, first and foremost, I think denouncing it without talking about it is probably a bad idea. So when, you know, there's a ton of people denouncing it, but by the way, these are the people I denounce. So, so it, 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 I, I can't flip and say, oh, Larry Summers now knows what he's talking about or right. I, I can't do that. Um, there are a tremendous number of smart people who think MMT is stupid, but, but, but I've also covered topics in my writings that I disagree with most of the world on. So, so, uh, so let, let, what I'd like to do is figure out what's, what's good about it first. And then, uh, so we could play a little ping pong here. Let's, let's say, What's good about it? And I'll, I'll open with uh, with uh, it's got people talking about how money works and where it comes from, right? That's a real plus because people weren't talking about that well, much, and now it's all over the literature, right? Well, and I, um, I I agree as well with you that it's good that people talk about it because I think too many people don't understand it, and they say things like doing MMT, and I've tried to stress. That MMT is is uh, there's two parts of it, and I think it, they've actually done themselves a big dis disservice by wrapping uh, their solutions up in the descriptive part of the economics uh, portion of it so much. I like to call it the descriptive and the prescriptive, and uh, right. and and I I really look at it. I like I was much more like you than I than I ever care to admit, and. Uh, Part of the reasons that I was attracted to it was because I, I, I wondered why didn't QE cause inflation? Why hasn't the Japanese bond market imploded? What's going on here? And um, and part of the reasons that I, I kind of went in and learned about it was because I, I was I was open to different ideas. And uh, one of the issues that I have is that too many people tell me how the system works and they're not really looking at the data. And when I looked at how MMT explained how the system worked, whether you believe in whether their kind of prescription about what you should do once you understand how the system works, that's another matter. That is a political right. decision. But the part that they, they, they go and they explain how the system works, I was attracted to it because they actually got way more right than anyone cares to admit. People mistake, they tell me Japan's doing MMT. Japan is not doing MMT. Japan is raising uh, taxes whenever they get a little bit of an uptick in their economy because they're so worried about balancing their budget. Do you know who's doing MMT? Trump is doing MMT. He's eight years into an economic cycle and he did the biggest tax cut that we've ever seen. That is, it, he, right, well, Pence, one second, I'll just say Pence, they ask him, why, if the economy is so good, why are you pushing for lower rates? And he says, because there's no inflation. So they're actually doing MMT. So that is the, that's kind of the first thing. I think most people don't understand that the U.S. is actually more MMT-like than Japan. Japan is extreme monetarism. That is what they are. Yeah, I, I think MMT's got, at some levels got it about 90% correct. The problem is, I also view it as like a, a race car that has about 90% of the necessary parts. Um, it, it won't, it won't drive anywhere. Um, well, or and, it'll, and so, it'll get, so or it'll get going, park, David, back, it'll get going and then fly off the road at high speeds, which is, I think, a, a, a common it, it argument. Won't get, it won't even get going. Oh, you don't yeah. think so? No, no, MMT will get going, but I think I think the model will will fail from the get go. So, so I I can agree with that. One of the problems with MMT is you've got um, what I think are some serious not n not you, but some serious whack jobs who are presenting it, and they can't keep their story straight, and and that's a real fundamental problem. So I actually posted a, a, a pair of tweets today. Um, in which uh, Stephanie Kelt basically denounced the idea that MMT intends to use taxes to control inflation. And then I pronounced, then I posted a second tweet in which Scott Fuller talks about using, Full Willer uh, talks about using taxes to control inflation, right? And these guys are, you know, two, two out of the four or five biggest leaders in the MMT movement. So they can't even keep their story straight. Um, the, the, the MMT to me, um, what they get right is that we're already kind of doing it in a, in a serious way, right? Government spending is being used to, to stimulate the economy and, and the government spending is, is forcing uh, growth in the money supply and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, I, I think where it fails, I think where it fails is, is first and foremost, they're confusing the fact that giving people jobs and giving people jobs to be productive are two fundamentally different things. So, you know, they're, they're, they're going to, 
what you need is a government. Here's 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 where where government could work well. If if every time the economy turns down, the government acts as a uh, financially interested and 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 incredibly logical agent. They would go do things that they know they have to do. They'd build bridges, they'd fix roads that they have to do while the labor and the cost of materials is cheap and not in demand and they're not competing with the free market. Wow. Right? And then that is David, right? but that is like, I completely and utterly concur. That is like, that is, and that's the opposite of what happened in 08. Right. Right. Like every way we just bailed out the banks. Right? Well, not only did Absolutely. we bail out the banks, everyone thinks that Obama was this spendthrift president because deficits rose so much. But the reality is that discretionary spending fell for three years in a row. And so we were cutting because of the Tea Party and we were doing pro cyclical cuts into a point when there was a lack of demand. So what you've just described well, is I, I completely and utterly concur, and I, I and I think it's so much smarter, and it's a, a great way to put it. I, I I really commend you for coming up with that way of putting it. But do it when it's cheap. Like that's a that's a way of getting. But, but, but what were they What were they cutting? What were they cutting? They, they were cutting everything they could. Don't forget the the Tea Party uh, cut a lot. Cutting what? I, no, no, no. You're talking about people on. I'll tell you what happened in chemistry. Here's a great example of what happened in chemistry. All of a sudden, we get emails from our program directors at federal funding agencies saying, please submit um, please submit uh, uh, requests, applications for supplements to your grants. And, and, and everyone's just submitting supplements to try to pump money into the system. So the, uh, there, there were cash for clunkers programs all over the place, but, but they're stupid. Cash for clunkers was the dumbest program on the planet. They took totally functional cars and destroyed them. I completely agree, people with a new, I completely agree, David. Why a didn't, new car they couldn't afford in a big debt. Right. right? Well, what did that do? Why didn't we go and fix all the bridges? Why didn't we go do the highways? Why didn't we go do the, uh, to the, um, to the airport airports and stuff? Uh, I have a question for you because you are kind of, a, uh, like a right wing reasonable fellow. Would you agree that Eisenhower's, um, program, you know, in the fifties, putting the GIs to work was a good thing or a bad thing? Um, I, I think it was a necessary thing. So they did a kind of an MMT thing. Right. So my, my theory on what they did, uh, it's probably written. So this is probably either demonstrably wrong or demonstrably right. If, if someone read about it, knows about it. But my suspicion is they said, holy cow, the GIs are coming home. We don't have jobs for them. You know, the society's really morphed over the five years. So let's tie them up in the, uh, let's tie them up in the uh, GI bill. Let's send them off to college. Right. Right. And and that'll buy us some time. And then and then they they built roads and they did. And the highway system was built under the auspices of being able to move troops around the country to defend ourselves, all sorts of things like that. All very constructive stuff. Right. Uh, what the world what a lot of people forget is we also own the, the entire world at that point. Everyone else was in a shambles. So we had a, an economy that was so poised to make a fortune. We were so productive. We, you know, our, our economy was driven by U.S. Steel and Ford and General Motors and Alco and companies like that, not by Facebook and, and, and NVIDIA and crap like that. And so, so our economy just doesn't isn't productive the way it was in the '50s. So, so we could afford to do stuff like that. So then, what happens is though. Um, so now, the second half of of my thesis is, and then when the economy starts rolling, government backs away and stops doing that. When when was the last time you heard a politician stand up and say the economy's rolling? Therefore, I'm going to pass a bill that's going to cut jobs. You're right. It doesn't happen. Never, never. So we only know the accelerator. And and I'll tell you, if 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 the government said, look, we, we need to build bridges and stuff, that'd be fine. The minute the word they start using phrases like stimulus, my skin crawls. Okay. I don't want them making decisions based on stimulus. I want them making decisions based on whether it's smart. Right. And and uh, well, I think the one thing that we'll agree on, Dave, though, is the fact that the current system is even more like screwed up effed up like let's do let's be honest the idea that we're going to continually lower rates to you know a, a, a smaller and smaller number and and the fed has even kind of introduced the idea about negative rates people don't realize it but the fed going and putting that into the minutes david rosenberg talks about this this is a big deal the fed is getting yeah. us ready for negative rates 
And I think that God, it, it makes me crazy. Makes me crazy when I hear that. Yeah, that and, Re and, and Reinhardt talking about how he can outlaw cash so that we can go to negative rates. Rogoff. Yeah, Rog Rogoff. Sorry, Rogoff. You know, they, all these guys they get confused in my head because they're so just ridiculous. Um, I think it's insane that we continually put more and more stimulus on the monetary, you know, side, and then we sit there and we kind of ignore the fiscal side. And so that's, to me, why MMT, at least, I, I, I agree that MMT will probably be abused and it will probably create inflation and too much inflation. But to me, what, you know, what don't we abuse on the monetary side? And I think that continually trying to push more monetary stimulus into the system is just as dumb, if not dumber. But so here's the problem. Uh, again, the government's so bad. One time I asked my dad, you know, what about national health care? My dad ran a business. He's president of New York State Builders Exchange. He's really phenomenally savvy about these things. He said, well, it sounds good in principle. He said, but every time he asks the government to do something, they do it horrifically bad job. And he says, so you don't hand your money to the government, ask them to spend it unless you absolutely have to. And so the problem is, is you got Stephanie Kelton who works for a socialist, right? Do you really want that person in charge of the economic policy? I don't think so. So so the, the, the problem is that government makes stupid decisions. They build bridges to nowhere. They built the big dig. How is that one? How'd that work out? Uh, they, uh, they, they, the, the high speed rail system in California. Yeah, but I mean, it, it's just idiocy. But now. Dave, for every, so you just should shut them down. But, but, right? for, shut them down. but for every argument you have about a big dig or whatever, you know, there's, there's the Eisenhower that, you know, you guys created an interstate system in the U S an interstate uh, ha highway system that made you the envy of the world and made you the most productive country for the next decades. And it was investment. And yeah, government's not perfect. But the idea of not investing and just kind of cutting back on fiscal spending because the government can't do anything right. I don't buy that either. I just don't I don't buy that argument. Maybe I'm not I, you know, maybe I'm not. Uh, I haven't seen the government make a mess of enough things to to be jaded enough. But I just don't see how the current system is going to work um, by by trying to pump more and more monetary stimulus into it either. Well, I'm not a mon. I don't want to pump money into it either. Okay, so but it's so, you're, you're giving me a you're no, giving no, me a false no, psychology. No, no, I'm not. I don't mean to do that. But I'm saying so. The alternative is so. Let's just say for, if you had your way in the world, you would leave money at two percent or something. Like you wouldn't have. I'm no. What would you do? So like, give me like that. You know, someone makes you the dictator tomorrow, and you can kind of fix the financial system. How would you fix it? I'd let it fall into its foundation right now. Right. So you know, I, I don't think you can build. You've got a you've got a rickety structure that's been that's been 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 created by years and years and years of monetary intervention. We've been at, we're at the end of a 38 year bond bull market that's been driven down by steady rate decreases. You can say the Fed loves to say the Fed economists love to say they're just following the markets. They're not creating them. Right. We're, we're at the end of our rope. When that bond bull market turns around, we're going to have a mess. On our hands. The Fed will do some incredibly stupid things. Society will do some incredibly stupid things to try to save this patient. I don't want to be there. I don't want that to happen. And so I, I want, I think the Fed should be a much more humble group. I think the Fed, for example, should should not set rates that force us into negative real rates, let alone negative nominal rates. So you know right. negative nominal rates are an abomination. And you know what they're gonna do? Here's the nightmare scenario. They 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 take away cash, right? They're talking about that. They're a bunch of status. These guys are status, right? In in the most pejorative terms, these guys are status. They're gonna try to take away cash, and then all our money's gonna be locked in the banking system. And then they're gonna set the rates at negative. And you go, oh, but they'll know where to put them. It's <laughs> they're trying to run the economy by a committee. Are you kidding me? That that, that never, never, never works. And you read the MMT crowd and they talk about they, they talk about how they'll have government committees to figure out what the right amount of this and that is. That'll be a disaster. And so the Fed, if we ever get to cashless, we're in trouble because then they'll send rates negative because they want to because their Gaussian models think they should be negative. And we'll be sitting there with money in the bank that's losing money. And they talk about, well, then we'll go to cash. But you know, let's say there's still cash. Well, they're talking about making a cash equivalent 
that depreciates, has timestamps on it that goes to crap. We're going to be hanging those bastards like Mussolini upside down if that happens, <laughs> in my opinion. And if we don't, it means we've lost. I pray we hang those bastards like Mussolini. There we go. Because they deserve it. They <laughs> I need another beer. It. Because, yeah, the, because these are PhD economists who are so stupid that they don't understand that the markets should be driven by Darwinian principles. They've lost their plot line completely. <laughs> okay, yeah. so Dave, what do you do to protect yourself, bud? How do you how do you perform, uh, you know position your portfolio? Is it all guns and ammo for you, bud? <laughs> well, I have plenty of gold and plenty of cash. It's a it's a barbell strategy, right? And the goal, you know, I, I post on Twitter a, a month or two ago a, a, a chart that came out of J.P. Morgan that happens to be dated from the year that I went from equities to gold. And my goal is beat equities two percent annualized over the last twenty years. And 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 it, it, gold is something like from from when it became legal to buy in the U.S. It's something like seven percent a year. So people say, ah, oh, you're a gold bug. You're just an idiot. 7% a year, you mourn. You would take 7% a year in a heartbeat from here. Yeah, well, And so I've got a lot of gold. I got a lot of cash. And I've got some, you know, the cash is, you know, low duration stuff. Like the uh, gold, what is, what is the gold done? I think it's something like it would buy you a nice suit in that 1920 or whatever. And it would still buy you a nice suit. Like, I think there's something about like uh, measuring it in terms of a man's suit and stuff uh, over the years. The gold there's a better measure than that. Actually, they say that it would have bought you a month's worth of manual labor in ancient Rome. Manual labor hasn't changed. Ah, Suits have changed. Suits are made out of polyester. You know, you, you're the Bee Gees. <laughs> And uh, and so who knows hey, what a good suit is? Not just the Bee Gees, also play? Patrick, also Patrick. His suits are made of polyester. <laughs> are they raspberry colored or anything like that? <laughs> there we go. Well, uh, it's been a joy having you on, David. We really appreciate it. It's always great to hear someone. Uh, Patrick didn't even need to talk because you were I, so bearish and you were such an I, end of the world kind it, of guy. I was, yeah, I was just enjoying the whole conversation. Yeah. I was so sitting, I, sipping I, out know, my beer. And I think that, you know, well, you two might be married, but we're soulmates, Patrick. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and you know what, though, Dave, you know, to, as much as you shit all over MMT, you're actually we're more in the same uh, camp about what the government should do in terms of the into the next uh, recession. And, uh, you know, the fact that that. That's the point when they should be spending instead of, you know, engaging in pro cyclical cuts, which I think is the craziest, stupidest thing in the world. I don't think I see. I think you're dreaming on the pro cyclical cuts. I don't remember those. Well, you know what? I'm going to send you a chart. I'm going to send you a chart and I'm going to send you a chart of the discretionary spending of the federal government's budget. And you'll see that there's been um, up until 2008, there was like two, maybe three years when it the uh, the budget deficit, the discretionary part of the federal budget deficit declined. Well, it declined. The deficit for, declined. No, it, the the spend the the uh, the it's it the uh, the actual whether it was a deficit or surplus, like or sorry, it, the the amount that it increased. So the, anyways, the, the slope of the, the growth in our debt. <laughs> no, no, it's not debt. It's deficit. It's deficit. It's negative. deficit it, in terms of it's always was increasing. And the three years when it right. went the other way in a row was during the uh, 2008 uh, decline. I'll, I'll include it in the show notes, everybody, and I'll send it to you. I'll put it on Twitter after we talk, after we're done today, David. Anyways, thanks again for joining okay. us. One last time. So uh, let me ask you this oh, one last question. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Is the next recession going to be severe? Um, Patrick thinks it's going to be the end of the world. <laughs> Can we have a, a generic recession? Do you think? Yeah, I actually, I'll take the other equation. side. I'll take the other side of that trade. I think that we could have a regular garden uh, run of the mill recession. I don't think it's as bad okay, as you I'll, guys think. I'll take the under on that bad. Okay, well there uh, you go. So uh, see, uh, you know, I, I, I love this Dave guy. He's great. Yeah, for sure. And not only that, Dave, you're not that far. <laughs> Cornell's not that far from Toronto, so we'll you know we'll settle it up with beers. And we'll come visit you, or my you'll wife, come. Visit. My wife loves Toronto. Oh well, we'll that's good. It. That's good to hear. Go Raptors, right? Yeah. 
<laughs> no, that didn't sound very enthusiastic, Dave. Is that, is that a hockey team? What sport is that? No, that's a basketball team. That's our that's our basketball team. Uh-oh. You guys must be really pissed about this. You know what the, the, the really maddening thing is? That we actually don't have a Canadian team in the uh, – we haven't had a Canadian team go that far in the, in the Stanley Cup playoffs forever. And here we are, and we have a basketball team. And most Canadians know about as much about basketball as uh, like f- Southern Americans know about hockey. Now, I probably pissed off a lot of our Canadian listeners, but uh, at least I don't know anything about basketball. And <laughs> here we are. We're in the finals, and uh, it's go-, go Raptors. I hope we do. I hope we crush them. Anyways, Dave, it's been a pleasure having you on. It's been really lots of fun. Do you have any transgenders on your team? That's the question. <laughs> there we go. Dave's really going to get us in trouble now. Okay, anyways, one last time, if people want to follow you, and you're a must-follow, because I really do, um, I really appreciate it. I, I think that you are, and I said that before, I think you are one of the few people that is willing to listen to different points of view and don't just automatically knee-jerk say, oh, no, that's a dumb. You come to your own de- conclusion and then say it's dumb, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm faking it. That's right. So where do they fall? Where I do think they... it's dumb from the start. That's right. Where do they follow you, uh, Dave? What? Where, they, what? Say that again. Where can they follow? Where laughing. can they follow you on Twitter? Give us your your full handle. Uh, David David B Column. There we go. And that's uh, by the way. You, that's how you can block me too. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Well, thanks again for being on. It's been a lot of fun. All right. Thanks a lot, Dave. Thanks for inviting me. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That wasn't bad, eh, Lena? <laughs> you guys are starting to, like, slow your word. Well, I'm <laughs> dying laughing the whole time. What, what, you know what's funny is that most people didn't recognize the fact that uh, that we reversed taped the show right. and so so by the time people are hearing the intro they didn't realize that kevin's three beers in <laughs> <laughs> three tall boys my tall boys that's the, you know what i've come to why is he the slurring stuff? at the beginning of the show yeah. that's a, uh, that's that's the problem so um, you know what the real problem is that you do it on an empty stomach as well although i did kind of eat but it was i ate after which is not really the, the key <laughs> <laughs> is this the part that's going in the uh, kind of the, the yeah the, yeah the actually if you want whatever, yeah, whatever sure. you guys let's want let's just really. go whatever sure what the hell <laughs> put it in there hey by uh, the way are we gonna get the new are we gonna get the new uh, fancy front footage like with all the pictures and stuff yeah it's gonna go in is, is that going in this week yeah so yeah I, 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 everyone's already saw it it's already oh, been okay the well there we show. go so they have all seen it Patrick dragged me off to a, you know, a lunch to take some pictures. I felt uh, super awkward, but uh, it's actually funny that Dave called us married because uh, we had some close-up shots like in there. Oh yeah, no, oh, yeah. Like... there's some real up close and personal pictures. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> the one that no one has seen was the one that we were stuck in a phone booth together. That was Shh, Patrick. No, but don't tell anyone. Those are our pictures. Oh my god. All right. Anyways, could have been broke back down. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>